Geico presents sharing versus oversharing. Today, Bridget Griffin shared a video of her daily yoga routine, two self-help articles, and her new blog called Build Your Inner Bridge with Bridge. Girl, your sharing has turned into oversharing. No worries, Bridge. Geico has some info worth sharing with your seven blog followers, like how you could save money on your car insurance, update your policy, and report a claim just by visiting geico.com. How's that for building your inner bridge? Bridge, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Blog Talk Radio. Knock, knock from that hot spot I don't know why I'm rhyming I'm in all black When the light's out You can still see that I'm shining I can't believe y'all made me come here Since I'm here Listen clear Just more smoke to the open air Prepare to fire It's so clear Pay homage I said pay homage This is ruthless Like a family of five And they ruthless I'm on my mind my, my, I flew the coop quick Like a G5 With no stewardess Forgive me God But this music Makes me feel like a god That's the truth Shh. I just laughed at the fact that's stupid Like being cross-eyed and toothless Better dot your eyes and cross your teeth if you talk to me But I don't talk that much, so just step aside The rap game's been bugged, I'm pesticide You better use this, if you catch your high, you misused it I'm not new to this, but it's my time New rules, new rules Been on my grind, take care of mine New cool What you know about me, I'm the next best thing Brain food, brain food, brain food. And if you ever around me, I don't sugarcoat Nothing I do, pay homage Peace. This is Kufu, Mahakaru with Timo Osiris Radio. We're going to take a brief intermission and play some music while we get the show shut up. So just bear witness for a second. Tonight's show will be dealing with the origins of the white race with Brother Goss and Gozi. And we will be going into the um, the evolution of the European race, uh, the different phenotypes, the different bone structures, where they came from, uh, their rise to the top of the uh, the human the, the the rise to the top of the world, you know. And um, just gonna have some historical facts as well. So just bear with me. I'm going to play a song real quick. And also, while we get the um, show loaded up, check us out, www.timosiresradio on the blog or www.timosiris.com for our website page, Timo Cyrus on Facebook. Uh, and Gozi DNA. Uh, check out brother some of our other brothers, brother Kansu, uh, Kalem with Talk with the Titans, brother Melvin, brother Cameron, Gichi Gala Jack. Um, everybody has some good information, so please uh, check those brothers out on the uh, on the web as well. So um, I got the studio loaded up. I'm going to go to a song real quick. And um, I see we have a lot of callers calling in already waiting. I appreciate you calling in. I appreciate you bear witness. Um, I appreciate you bear uh, band with us. I have some uh, internet issues. But I'm going to just play one song real quick. Then we're going to get right into the show. Um, if you have your press one on your keypad, we'll bring you in and uh, bring you into the conversation at any time during the call. So get into a track real quick. See what I got. Call me Rosie Gold. I got holy friends. Holy ho. I'm in holy hands. Rosie Gold. I got holy friends. Holy ho. I'm in holy hands. Rosie Gold. I got holy friends. Holy ho. I'm in holy hands. 
Fire, fire, I desire red smoke And it's burning, baby You learning, baby You are not on earth You want that hate I got holy friends Hold your home I'm in holy hands Rosy gold, I got holy friends Holy hope, I'm in holy hands Hold- uh, this is Kofu, and I'm back. We just had to take a small break, small intermission. Uh, this is Timo Size Radio. Uh, got the foremost runner of the Westerner, the Wasir, the Saw himself, Brother Ngozi. Peace. What's good? Peace to you, Brother Timo Size. Let's get it. What's the word, y'all? Uh, you know what it is. Uh, today's show, we're supposed to be breaking down the uh, the origins of the white race. Where do they come from? Mm-hmm. How do they become white? Where, what is their lineage? Um, out of Africa, which way did they go? Where did they get stuck at? How do they develop their technology, their diet? How they interact interacted with their environment? Uh, how they was able to come out of a, a situation to being trapped up in Europe or in the Caucasus Mountains to you know to appear to be ruling the world to this day, and how they even got there. So what we want to start out is, um, I guess we could start out basically giving a brief overview of the um, out of Africa theory. Where did these people actually come from? Because a lot of people, they think that, you know, they came from black people or they came from Africans, indigenous Africans. And, you know, we went through an article before that was over, um, <clears throat> that said that the Nubians went into the Levant. 70,000 years. Yeah, hundred some thousand years ago. It was and, yeah, it was. I think it was 160, and then they had another one that they went up there. I think he was saying 70. But right, that's it was when a, they started breathing with a, the Neanderthal. Yeah, that was a. It was um. Let, let, let's go a little bit before our species, because you had a few out of Africa, um, um, Af- out of Africa um, migrations that wasn't successful. So you had one with our species that happened around 160,000 years ago, but that really wasn't successful. And we know this because we're finding fossils or anthropologists. I find fossils of modern humans um, in China and certain parts of Israel, like the Skahul Cave in Israel, around 100,000 to 120,000 to 90,000 years. Those migrations wasn't successful. Now, the one that was successful was the out of Africa um, successful um, migration, which occurred 70 to 60,000 years ago. And I talk about the phylogenetic tree or a specific SNP or haplogroup that shows and proved this and show a, a variant, something called the YAP marker, which shows this before the, epi, the epigenetics when environment can turn genes off and on, when it's hard to allow cells to read genes because environmental pressures is causing genes off and on to cause um, switches, and we see the phenotype looking different externally. So I'm going to go into prior out of African migrations to talk about his proto-ancestors or archaic groups of humans that left out of the continent before our species did that didn't succeed. Homo erectus left out of Africa, which is the offshoot of Homo agastar, and he leaves out of Africa or arose in Africa around 2 million years ago. A little bit afterwards, you have 1.8 million years ago when a lot of them start to leave out. You start to find Homo erectus, 
which is homo genius, which is part of the homo the human family. Homo means same, genius is the species that we are, homo genius. Our branch of the genius is sapien sapien. Their branch of the genius genius was erectus, homo erectus. Anyway, when these species leave out of Africa, they leave out around one eight million years ago. We know this because when you were in the Georgia area near the Caucasus, you look at Homo demonansi, and you can see that these um, creatures was around 1.75 million years ago, which is not older. Now, we have to understand point percentages. 1.75 is not older than a whole 1.8 or 1.9 or 2 million. 1.75 is on the border, 8, 9, 10, or 8, 9, 3, three numbers off from that whole 2.0. So we also have to understand that 2.0 or 2 million years ago is when the earliest Homo erectus formed in Africa, which is Homo ergastar. So these species leave out of Africa. You find their fossils in, um, in wolf caves where they was dragged to. You find them in China. You find them all over. You know, that's one successful one. Homo erectus was all through, you know, certain parts of Europe, certain parts of Asia, all types of places. So this is 1.8 million years ago. Then you have another migration that occurred with another offshoot of our early archaic human ancestors. The genius is um, Hedabagensis. Hedabagensis was responsible for giving rise to our species and Neanderthal. He breaks out of the continent around 600,000 years ago. 600,000 years ago, Homo Hedabagensis leaves out of Africa, and he starts to go in a different directions. In some parts, he becomes um, um, Homo Neanderthalus, which we know um, about the Neanderthal. Then he becomes Dinosovan the Siberian areas. And in some areas, he even goes into become um, other um, groups like the Red Deer Cave people, but the Red Deer Cave people were more closer to, that they just found in China in the cave 13, uh, 13,000 years old, they were more closer to our, our early archaic specimen of Homo sapiens sapiens, archaic Homo sapiens sapiens. Because you have Homo sapiens sapiens and then you have the uh, earlier group, which is archaic groups, and they survive long enough and then you find these fossils in the Red Deer Cave in China. But but they did, but these creatures evolved in Africa. They did, they did, they wasn't a direct offshoot of Homo erectus began outside of Africa. So that's another um, successful one that that happened. But they didn't get a chance to breed with people. But anyway, Homo erectus began as leaves out 600,000 years ago and becomes different variants of, um, of different types of hominids from Homo neanderthalis to Homo neanderthalis. Now Homo neanderthalis, we know that he was outside of his lead uh, because the environmental pressures that he developed in caused him to have rickets. His rear cage is much wider. Um, the creatine level of the carinocytes uh, carino carino levels was much more higher because he adapted in colder climate, so his skin was brute and tougher to adjust with cold climate. Um, his vocal box, it shows that his vocal box, from the way he sound, he had a high-pitched voice. The back of his neck was much more wider, and, he, and, he was, um, and, his, and, his, and his shoulders was more broad. So he developed poorly in a poor environment. I mean, if you have rickets, this is some type of vitamin D deficiency. Which shows that this creature didn't develop, and, um, and he wasn't from there originally. He developed in that area in a poor environment. So he had a lot of ailments that came with it. And when you look up now, and they're finding out, anthropologists are finding out that, you know, from the salt tissues that they can measure of Neanderthal, he had a lot of deformities, a lot of deformities, addictions, um, diabetes, all types of weird stuff they're finding out about this creature because he developed in a poor environment compared to Homo dinosaurian who lived in, a little at this time, Siberia was a little bit more warmer, and he also traveled all the way through um, Malay, uh, Melanesia, where a lot of the black people that you find on the Solomon Islands have Dinosovan traits, they have Homo Dinosovan traits. So these are archaic human groups that left out of Africa, right? Now we get to the point of a specific group of people. Let's go to the phylogenetic tree. Now, okay, let's, pause, let's, let's, let's pause with the um, archaic. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna to try to get people in, uh, you know, involved with the conversation. Um, we're gonna bring callers in as they put their hands up, but you gotta stay relative to the subject because we're gonna to try to have a flow and a narrative here. Um, this is Timo Size Radio. Check us out www.timosize.com. Timo Size on uh, Facebook. I made Kamara and Gozi DNA Facebook. Caller from the two six seven piece. You're on with Timo Cyrus. Okay. Got the hand raised? Yeah, call up from the 267. Hello? Uh, okay, let's just keep it moving. We're with the archaic humans. He's about to go into the, uh, now, the genetic. Now, yeah, now, you know, our species or, or humans, 
which was the first offshoot of Australopithecus afarensis, but those wasn't humans. Autopithecus wasn't humans. Or Sahil Autopithecus wasn't a human. None of those or none of those different um, Australopithecus things was, was, was humans. These were the predecessors of humans. Our earliest branch of humans comes from Handyman. The first human developed around 2.5 million years ago, and his name is Homo habilis. Homo habilis, 2.5 million years ago, gave rise to Homo ergastar, which became Homo erectus. None of those, none of the, he didn't leave out. You know, that's the one that they found out that Homo nilati was possibly breed with, um, uh, his ancestor was a crossbreed between Australopithecus and Homo habilis. This is why his feet looked the way they looked in his, in, 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 the, in his hands. So, that's a different story. So, Homo habilis didn't leave out. It was Homo erectus that left out. You know, and before, after him, Homo heterobiogenes left out. And also, Homo ancestor, which is another offshoot of Homo ergastar or Homo erectus, that also left out, and they found these fossils in Germany. So these... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, that's cool. 267, I, your, your line is open. You can raise your hand again. What's good? Timo Cyrus. What's good? Timo Cyrus, back at the fire. My fault. I had my uh, my phone on mute. What's good with y'all? I'm just sitting back. Um, letting y'all just, just listen. Who? Letting y'all just go back. It's Bunchy Carter. What's good? Oh, peace, brother. What's going on? Peace. What's good, and good? What's good, Kufu? Peace, man. Please yeah, what's good, man? Yeah, I got I got a few things going on, so I'm gonna just mute my mic. I'm gonna chime in a little bit. Okay, cool. Uh, so what? what, what, what okay, what? go ahead. You were talking about uh, Homo nilotti, and then you were talking about Homo an- an- ancestor. Yeah, Homo ancestor. He left so out Homo of Africa. Na- so Homo nilotti. So basically, they was going back and forth. They was already breeding. Yeah, they was already they were already breeding. Before even anatomic you, humans come on the scene. Be- yeah, even before anatomic. Um, humans came or modern humans came they were already breeding even modern human is just not a result of natural selection we're also a result of sexual selection there was a lot of cross breeding that happened in order for us to become what we are in between so it wasn't just natural selection that occurred it was also you know a sexual selection we found this out when you discovered a haplogroup group a zero zero haplogroup group a zero zero predates modern human fossils so the oldest fossils that they found of a modern human of our species goes back 200,000 years in Ethiopia, in Omo Valley. But, and it was a female. But then you turned around and found Omo Man 1 and Omo Man 2. Now, Omo Man 1 and Omo Man 2, they were Homo sapien adult 2, which is a little archaic branch of a Homo sapien sapien. They really wasn't Homo sapien sapien. The oldest branch of our species was Homo sapien sapien, which was the fossils they found was a woman. Now, with scientists like um, 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 Michael Hammer and, and other groups of... Um, He's a geneticist and um, a few anthropologists. What they're discovering is, is that it's a possibility that females evolve into modern humans first, not humans. I'm talking about anatomically correct humans that we are now, or modern humans, because what they're finding out is that the oldest fossils, which exist a little bit prior before Homo man one and Homo man two, the oldest fossils of a modern human was a female. It was a it's not um, Lucy. Lucy, that people talk about, who's, who people call Degnesh, and I hear people talking about the oldest one who was three million years old. That wasn't a female woman. That was an Australopithecus afarensis. Degnesh is nobody but Lucy. Do the history of Degnesh. The Ethiopians that discovered her called the Degnesh, and the scientists that put it out there on the scene called her Lucy, and it was a reason why. You guys can look into the history of Australopithecus afarensis. But with modern humans, they found the modern human fossils belong to a female. And she was 200,000 years old. Now we know about Omo Man 1 and Omo Man 2 in southern Ethiopia, but even those groups was a little bit archaic, and these were men. But she was a 200,000-year-old fossil. But what's going on? How did this happen? First of all, most humans back then were hunter-gatherers. So with them being hunter-gatherers, men was always going out to hunt. Compared to women who sat down, they had more time to think, organize things, keep things in a certain structure, and also they had more time to function. Even when you deal with genes, female genes develop a little bit more quicker or they become more, become more um, adulterate quicker than men. So it's a possibility that females evolve into modern humans before men. Because when you discover haplogroup group A00, which they found in the African-American man, um, Michael Hammer, he discovered in the African-American man, and they were trying to find out why is it that this gene or this haplogroup group goes back 338,000 years, but modern human fossils only go back 200,000 years. What the hell is going on? So what he did was he went back into, uh, he was tested DNA, and he went back to the slave coast that a lot of our ancestors were taken from, from southwestern Central Africa. You know, Ivy Coast, Gold Coast, 
you know, in Central Africa, near, you know, um, Congo or whatever. So when he go into the rainforest, he discovered the same haplogroup group amongst the Mbuti people, a small pygmy people. And then he found it amongst 11 of them. And, and, when, and when he went back, he's like, okay, now they're trying to say that these people were breeding with archaic humans that was already in the rainforest. So you have these people from East Africa who were probably already modern humans, but when they go into West Africa or the, you know, different parts of West Africa, they start breeding with these archaic group, possibly homorotogenesis, which is another one that exists. One of the first offshoots from Homo heliogenesis that became Homo rotogenesis or Homo rotoferensis, which gave rise to Homo sapien or Homo sapien adults who that became Homo sapien sapien later. A lot of the remnants of him are still floating around. So we have haplogroup group A00. And from A00, from the phylogenetic tree, the SNP mutates into A0, then A1b, and then A1bt. And from A1bt, you find these four subclade branches of A. From A00, you get to A0, and then A1, and then A1bt, and then ABT. You find these ABTs and the A0, not A00, amongst modern humans like the Koi San that live in South Africa, or the Nur of Sudan, or the Mercy, or the Summer. These groups, or the Dinka, a few of them have this... Um, the after effect of A00, which became that. So it's a possibility that A00 was breeding with L0, and L0 was a little bit before genetic Eve that we know. Genetic Eve that left out of Africa was mitochondria DNA L3, not L1, not L2. It was L3. And when you follow the MT DNA, you find L3 becomes M and N outside of Africa or on her way out the door of Africa. She becomes M. A few of them stay back and go into L3, L4, L5, L6 which stays on the eastern coast of Ethiopia. Then she becomes M on her way out the door. Then she goes near into the Middle East and becomes M, M1, where she carries M1, and M becomes M1, M2, M4. You find it all through India. A few of those women come back in. This is why in East Africa or Northeast Africa, you find mighty conjure DNA M in there. You also find U6 in North Africa. So in the back migrations of the continent, you find more foreign women who come back in, bringing their mutations with them. This is why in North Africa you find mitochondria DNA H up there. That's the Sami um, haplogroup that comes from Southern Europe, but it develops somewhere in the Near East, near the Caucasus areas, in the Near East and Central Asia. It comes back in. You find mitochondria DNA U6 coming back in. That's been in North Africa for almost 20,000 years. Then you find it's M1. M1 is what a lot of Ethiopian and Somali women have. Then you find the L4s, L5s, L6s. So you find them coming back in. The phyl in the phylogenetic tree, when you look at the mitochondria DNA, is more variance in the MT side than it is on the uh, paternal side or the Y chromosome side when you start looking into it. So right now we're just dealing with the genes. So it's a possibility that the ones who evolved in the modern anatomically correct human first were females because she was breeding with these different archaic groups. And these different archaic groups breeding in between gave rise to the complexity of the Homo sapiens sapiens, which started through our mother. And if she kept breeding with a little bit more archaic groups, she gave birth to, you know, sons eventually like we have now. And the sons go from A00 to A0 and from A0 to A1B and from A1B to ABT and then from BT. We go all the way down to haplogroup CT, which develops in East Africa. And it was through him, which is yet positive, who gave rise to my haplogroup E, the Egyptians haplogroup E, the Ethiopians haplogroup E, your haplogroup E, African Americans haplogroup E, and he also gave rise to the D markers that a lot of people in Japan have, and the CF and the CV20 of the fraternal men that they found in, in Russia, and these other groups of people, all the way down through IJK that splits off and become IJ. One group of the IJ is going to Europe, the Cro-Magnon people, and branch off and become the single I. Another group stay behind and become the haplogroup JP209 in the Arabian Peninsula, and from JP209, J1, and J2. This is what happened. But the C, but the E marker, which is um, EM96, which develops in, in, in Africa, stayed behind. He never left out. And then from there, he gave rise to that different um, um, subclad branches of E, all the way down from, you know, half the group, you know, um, M M M96, all the way down to um, the EP2, and then you find from EP2, you develop the E1B1As and the E1B1Bs that stay behind. Compared to the people that left out, you find these D markers outside, and a lot of the dark skinned people, the Adam and Islands, have D markers, which develop in Asia. Even though they are still dark skinned, it develops in Asia. And if some person asks the question, why are these people still dark skinned? It's, it's, it's a reason why. If you understand equatorial zones, zone one, and understand a different the type of ultraviolet rays that they get, it makes sense that people that left out of Africa was able to maintain their dark skin. Now, if we understand epigenetics, 
Epigenetics just shows how environmental pressures can cause um, genes to switch off and on. But we also understand that in genetics or mutations, mutation starts um, inside first before outside. So it's inside before you start to see it happen on the phenol side. So a lot of the people that you find outside of Africa, like the dark-skinned people in India and the black people in the Adam and Islands, the Onji people, they were able to maintain their dark skin because they live in Zone 1, and the Zone 1 allows them to maintain their levels of tyrosine, which is responsible for the hormone melanosomes, with that hormone melanosomes, which gives us the melanocytes, which gives us a higher levels of darker pigment. So they were able to keep that, but due to them eating different foods, certain types of turtle meat that are left out of Africa, that, and different types of plants and crops that's not in Africa, it allowed the gene variants to change. So they don't have the same half the group that people did that stayed within Africa. They'd have their own unique markers that mutated within the continent of Asia. So this is the first out of Africa descendants. You feel me? These are the first out of Africa descendants. Go ahead. Correct. That's good. So everybody want to know what's the origins, you know, in the Afrocentric circle, they might say the beast, the Mm -hmm. devil, you know, but in the scientific team on size group, you know, we just deal with the degenerate human. The degenerate uh, human, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, degenerate human. Um, mm-hmm. Which one of those lineages went into Asia, got stuck in Asia, developed more mutations, then carried the SLC45A2 into Europe? Well, we have to understand what happened. The SLC245, which is salute carrier family 24, sodium potassium calcium exchanger, member 5, which goes on in the NCXT con- uh, contents inside of um, a depletion or um, a shift in 111 amino acids, acid, which which is responsible for allowing them to develop this uh, so-called uh, pale skin or this pinkish skin, which is still a form of melanin, but it's low. We can't really – I mean, some people, like, I can be, you know, philosophical and equate it to – uh, fail melanin, but fail melanin is really what we have on our nipples, our genitalia areas, and the pink part of our lips. So I just say that as a joke, but I also say it as a, as a slick remark that refers to something called spurs. So it's a low level of your melanin, which is not in high content as yours. So they're just one cell away from albinism, or a few cells away from albinism with this mutation SLC245, which is depletion of 111 amino acid. This happened in Central Asia. Before that, if you go back 24,000 years, 34,000 years, a lot of modern humans over there the skeletal structures already changed, meaning that they didn't have pronatistic features compared to autonatistic features that modern Caucasians have. So the skull structures was already kind of changed, the aquiline features. You start to see that develop in East Africa, then you start to see it with the Vidoite race in earlier Saudi Arabia, like the, um, the Mahari groups of Saudi Arabia, the Mahari. They are dark-skinned people, but they have narrow features. The Javidians, like the Arulas. And then you start to find it with the people in early Iraq and Iran. These were brown skinned and dark skinned people that lived in their certain zones. So you start so the earliest Caucasian twenty four thousand years ago looked more like Alicia Keys or Obama. I'm talking about as far as the skin tone. It was brown, light brown. Even when you mix it up with Neanderthal, who also had fair skin, if you mix it up with, like they did in Israel around 50,000 years ago, when modern humans bred with Neanderthal, who had fair skin, you still don't get pale skin. You still get the lightest brown color. So that's so it's impossible for them to have. This is a whole other mutation. This SLC245 mutation happened around 6,000 to 10,000 years ago when you start to see a completely fair-skinned people that's, that's, that's so unique that it looks damn near close to albinism, but it's not. It's a lot of things that goes on in between the SLC245, also the mutation of the OCA2, which affects the HARC2 level, or OCA2, Ocleocutaneous strand 2, which is the second strand of albinism. So we have to understand what's going on with these different um, genetic variants that happen. So these people come out of Central Asia, and the paternal lineage that they had was haplogroup R1B, which is an offshoot of haplogroup P. I mean, before R1B, you had R1, R1, uh, R1A and R1B, then you have R1, and then you go all the way back to haplogroup P that develops in Kazakhstan, near, again, Central Asia. Um, okay, so when you pause right there, then mm-hmm. Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Timo Cyrus is on the horizon. We're going to bring a call in. Caller from the 863, you are now in tune with Timo Cyrus. Peace. Peace. Peace to the kings on the line. It's brother, brother Patah. What's going on, Ngozi? Peace, Patah. What's, cool? what's going on, bro? What's going on? Chilling, man. Chilling, man. Hey, I have a question. Can you mm-hmm. um, break down the uh, the rhesus factor in humans and also touch on uh, the sulfur content and the uh, cell structure of humans? 
Yeah, we, we, we're going to get into that um, right after we deal with this Kazakhstan thing. We'll, we'll definitely pick up on that. Yeah, because it's not. The respect in humans is not what, I'm just going to say this to your touch-up, it's not what people think. Most people are RH positive. It's only, it's, it's only a few people on the planet that's RH negative, and that's a problem. RH negative is, 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 is not rare, it's RH positive. So we can get into blood types and different things later. So, so we'll find out what's going on with this certain D antigen that most humans have compared to people that don't have that D antigen, which is RH negative, which is really rare. That's the thing, because most of them, I mean, I hear racists or people that deal with pseudoscience or try to say, oh, white people are mostly RH negative. That's not true. I mean, that's not true at all. When you deal with the first case of uh, marithoblastosis, it was a French midwife. But, you know, that's not common amongst uh, the RH negative is, is when women have RH negative. And that's the problem when they breed with a person that is RH positive. And what happens is, is that her blood attacks that baby and it kills it. And it becomes a chemical reaction called erythroblastosis. And what doctors do now, because it's so rare, they give them a D antigen shot. So now we got to understand how antigens work in blood. <laughs> so that's, 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 that's I'm going to answer that question right there I'm, uh, I'm blood type B positive But I'm also RH positive You have Africans on the continent that's RH positive It has nothing to do with us mixing backwards and forward And all that other bullshit they saying That's bullshit Just like you have monkeys, baboons With, with blood type O negative Look it up All that shit talking about O negative means original That's bullshit You have chimpanzees I mean uh, not chimpanzees but <laughs> But um, baboons with blood type O negative. Look into that right now if you get a chance, brother. So I'm just gonna give you a glimpse of that about how those antigens work. Yeah. Okay. And then to go back to what um, um Kufu had first talked about um, about the haplogroup coming out of uh, the continent or in the Middle East, um, would uh, mm -hmm. Homo ergaster or Homo um, uh, uh, erectus 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 be uh, mm -hmm. be the first ones to to have those haplogroups. No, no, no. They they haplogroups. But see, the, the phylogenetic tree that we're dealing with now, from from this age, from the not A zero zero, but the beginning of A zero and A zero. This is modern humans, and these genes oh, go back two hundred thousand. Okay. A zero zero goes back three hundred thirty eight thousand. So. 338,000, that that's not even a modern human. So all of the, this, this is what kills the whole thing that the white man is a Neanderthal. There is no haplogroup that none of us have on this planet that comes from a Neanderthal. All our haplogroups are from modern humans. And from the paternal side, it's an offshoot of haplogroup CT. And from the mitochondrial DNA side, for the people outside of Africa, it's an offshoot of haplogroup L3. Um, people outside of Africa has the less genetic variations than we do. They have over 150 genetic variants compared to Africa is more diverse. You have 250. So you have more diversity on the continent of Africa compared to, compared to outside, meaning less, meaning that it, it, uh, these people that live out of the continent, there wasn't even that many people. They didn't even take that many unique traits with them. Most diversity starts in the continent before even leaving out. And that's, that's, that's right. how so, we well, how became... Yeah, I was just going to yeah, say so, how we became Homo sapiens sapiens. Because of the genetic diversity of our predecessors. Correct. Outside of Africa, there's only 150. Within Africa, 200. And that's dealing with all the homo DNA in the chain. Go ahead, brother. I was just going to ask, well, the L3 is in Africa. L L2 and L3 is in Africa, right? Yeah, L3, L2, L1 is in Africa. I'm L3, F1, B1. My ancestors migrate from East Africa and go through the Sahel Belt. And when they go through the Sahil Belt, a lot of them are responsible for speaking the um, Chadic languages, which is the Afroasiatic language, which is Hausa, which is Afroasiatic. They have mitochondrial DNA L3, F1, B2. Mine is L3, F1, B1. It stays within the Sahil, and a lot of them become pastoralist Fulani women. And a few of them kind of sprinkle into northern Nigeria and become the northern Yoruba groups compared to the ones in the southern Yoruba groups. And a few of them go all the way down to Senegal and, and uh, different parts of Mauritania. So L3, F1, B1 is an offshoot of L3, but she went west. Compared to the other L3s, they leave out and become M and N, and from M and N, they become U1, U2, U3, U4, U5, U6. That's the offshoots of N. The ones that are the offshoots of M become M, M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, M6. And then the ones that also kept going all the way down to those U's, they go back and through the, like certain parts of Mongolia and become 
mitochondrial DNA, B and A, and a lot of those are the ones that was responsible for coming through the Bering Strait and making it to the Americas as they crossed the Siberian mountains. And the other ones who left out, like mitochondrial DNA M2, she also made it to the Americas and haplogroup group um, 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 M130, which is the same haplogroup, group, which is the first offshoot of haplogroup group CT M168, M130 is what Aboriginal Australians have. You find those gene variants in people in South America, which shows that somewhere down the line, you have two types of people living in America, a black population of Aborigines groups and a lighter brown population who cross the Siberian and the, um, the Siberian Australia and the Mongolian Australia becoming an Inuit in Alaska with haplogroup group P and Q and other little branches. All right, that's what's sure. up, man. P, uh, Brother Fatah, man, we're going to leave your line open. We're going to get back to this Kazakhstan thing, and so we're going to get, you know, try to bring it all the way up to, you know, this modern cool. European, because we're dealing with the origins. Um, appreciate you calling in, man. We're going to keep the line open. Yeah, that's my brother, Simpson. He keeps he keep the oh, yeah, definitely. He keeps he keep, he keep the dim lights and sin moving. move, and he asks the questions that gut people. I, lo- I love it. That's my brother. Yeah, I'm, I, met, I met the brother. He's a good brother. He's got a beautiful family. Yes, sir. So, yeah, you want to um, start back with the, the Kazakhstan? So, yeah, in Kazakhstan, which is, you know, Central Asia, you know, you have Turkey, you have Kazakhstan, all these areas. All this is Central Asia. And it's right here, you know, where you start to find, you know, the common father of haplogroup R, from R, and R1, and R1, you have R, uh, R1B and R1A that split and go different directions. It's these populations of people, and you can find this in Human Journey, written by Spencer Wells, and also the documentary of this individual, um, where they found in Kazakhstan. And it's through these people who look similar to, uh, they look similar to mongoloids, but they're not. They look similar to them. They're not really mongoloids. That's how they found out now that even in um, uh, early America, a lot of early Americans had so-called European genes. They wasn't, they didn't look like modern Europeans today. The genes mutate first before phenotype. They just carry those traits over. And you also find a clovic um, culture and different shit that's real similar that was going on, and, you know, and a few peoples in the early Americas and in, in the early Europe. So you find it over here, and people might say, well, isn't Goldie saying that Europeans was first? No, I'm not saying that. They didn't even look like that. You just had dream, genes that was already migrating going through Siberia as well, as well with those traits coming over here, you know. And the mongoloid is nothing but a, a cousin to, and, and there's no such thing as a mongoloid race. This is a phenotype that people develop. You know, there's no such thing as a Negroid race or a Caucasoid race. This, if you deal with epigenetics, phenotype is exterior, and it's based off, you know, genes going off and on because different environmental pressures are cause things to look a certain way. So we got to get out of that idea that, you know, uh, I'm saying that mongoloids was here first or, you know, a certain population was here first. Genes can go off and on, especially when you deal with polytopicity. Polytopicity can make things look go backwards and forward. You can put two different types of organisms in a similar environment and they can look the same because of the levels of temperature but when you go and dissect it, it's not the same. And that's the trick of polytopicity or throwback polymorphism. Poly means multiple morphism is a change that goes on in between. So, you find this shit going on, man. You know, um, early humans that, that, you know, that migrate through here. So anyway, back to this um, Kazakhstan situation, it's these people that give rise to uh, early proto-Caucasians before migrating even to the Caucasus Mountains. A good book to read on this subject, and I'm giving my reference, is a book by Nail Painter called The History of White People. Look this book up, Nail Painter, History of White People. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think the sister is a geneticist or anthropologist. But she's legit and she's real. You can see her teaching also on a type of name up, Nail Painter, History of White People. She's breaking shit down, yo. Type up. So it's okay. this population. It's this population that uh, migrates and become the proto or first. Proto means first or before uh, Caucasian. This is even before the Indo-European languages that arose in Turkey around 3,000 or 4,000 years ago. These people were the ones that populated and went to different directions of Central Asia, and later on became Caucasian from that area going through. Because if you deal with the Caucasus Mountains, you have the Minor Caucasus and the, Mi- and the Major Caucasus. The Minor Caucasus, they call it the horseshoe. And you have the Black Sea, which is the minor Caucasus. You have near the Black Sea, below which which is right above Turkey, and above that you start seeing the major Caucasus near the Ural Mountains. That's near Russia and Mongolia and all that shit. 
So this is the direction that they went before even migrating into the Caucasus area. So these early Caucasians before going into the Caucasus Mountains came out of Central Asia. Look up Kostikimon, haplogroup CV20, Kostikimon that they found in Russia. I think the so man the, just so the name of the book is K O S T I N K O S T I N K I. Man, go ahead, brother. You said the name of the book was called the History of White People. History of White People. Nail Painter. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I I checked it out. It's uh, it's on Amazon. Yes, sir. N E N E L L last name Painter T A. I That's right. That's right. So yeah, this is a good book which explains, you know, different things that went on and um different things that occurred. Also Spencer Wales book, Human Journey, if you want to understand understand the route that we went through to become what we are as as, as Homo sapiens sapiens. So anyway, um before we even made it to Central Asia and before we made it to Kazakhstan, human beings was already breeding with Neanderthals. We started breeding with Neanderthals. But you gotta understand um, at the end of the Pleistocene, Pleistocene ranges in between um, 2,588,000 years ago and it ends 11,700 years ago. But even before that, around in the Mendel Glacier period, which which occurred, the early caps of the Mendel Glacier period, a lot of the Neanderthals found their way out of uh, the northern caps and they go into, they make it as early as far as all the way down to Israel. Israel. So around 50,000 years ago, you know, modern humans is meeting up with these motherfuckers over here. Now, we know that the first hybrids between Neanderthals and modern humans, um, due to Neanderthal gene variance, was 99.7.5% similar. It was off by 0.12%. It, it ranges between 99.5% to 99.7.5%. So, due to those little unique changes at the demi level, that's large. So, even though we're different subspecies of Homo genius, he's Homo Neanderthalus and we're Homo sapiens sapiens, at the same time, he's still human. You can mix and breed with, with, with certain species within our genus between 1.8 million years. If you go back to uh, 1.8 million years, you can find these things. We can, you can adapt and you can breed. It doesn't mean that the, the offspring will be successful. They might live three days. They might live up to five years. They might live up to ten years. It's not going to be successful. So between now and 1.8 million years within a homogeneous branch, you can do it. It's impossible for you to breed with Homo habilis because it's a little bit too far off. His gene connections, connections was more close to Australopithecus afarensis. But anyway, Neanderthal, which was a subspecies of our branch of humans, but he still was human because you have different subspecies of humans back then. Today, we don't have different subspecies. We're all the same species. So you can get that out of your head. But back then, we had different subspecies of the human family. Um... He was able to breed with them. But the first offspring that were males were sterile. The same thing when you have a liger. Now, in my video, I said something out of context. We was in a going with the flow. I said a donkey. A donkey's not sterile. It's a mule. That's what I meant to say. That's when I was outside of New York. But anyway, what I'm saying about here is, is that ligers, male ligers are sterile. Female ligers are not sterile. She can breed with a male lion or a male tiger to give off offsprings. But a male liger, that shit is dead. So the first hybrids between Homo sapiens, sapiens, and Neanderthal, those first males were sterile. It wasn't successful. So they bred with their offshoots, which was the daughter hybrids. Now, okay, pause right there. Okay, we're going to pause. Timo Cyrus is on the horizon. Um, listen to Timo Cyrus Radio. Brother Kansu, peace. Peace, peace, family. What's going on, man? Peace, Brother Ngozi. Peace, um, peace Brother, brother Kufu. Team Osiris on the horizon, bro. Yes, sir. Let's get it. Let's yes, get sir. It. Yes, sir, man. I was listening. I don't want to disrupt your wisdom, man. Go ahead. Okay, okay. But yeah, okay, but, it goes. Where where was this? Where was they? Where were they breeding at? The um, when they were, you know, the modern humans and the um, Neanderthals. And they started doing it in the Middle East, in the so-called Middle East, in in, in this Israel area. That's when he started doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so Abraham was a was a I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure if I'm sure Alec no, Bogle, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just damn funny. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, they they started doing it in Israel, the Middle East, even before they made it to Kazakhstan. See, we don't find a half blood group of humans that ma a sex chromosome in humans that matches up with Neanderthal. You find it in the autosomal DNA, and you find it in our human leukoantigens, the way our immune system responds to certain things and certain traits that we have, or the high level of carinocytes or keratin in Caucasian skin. 
which allowed them to adjust to cold climate and shit. This is where you find this shit at. You don't find it in a, in a sex chromosome in any of our phylogenetic tree from haplogroup A, meaning the beginning, all the way down to the last haplogroup R1B for uh, in a phylogenetic tree, or from the mitochondria DNA L0 all the way down to mitochondria DNA, you know, uh, C through B, which is the last on the mitochondrial side. So you don't find all these are modern human haplogroups or sex chromosomes. You find this shit going on early down the line, and it happened. And a lot of us kept, you know, it wasn't that many of them. So even though we were breeding with them, the offshoot males wasn't successful. The daughters were successful. And those offshoot hybrid daughters kept breeding with more modern humans, reducing the Neanderthal gene from 50% to 25, breeding with more modern humans from 25 to 15 to 12 and 13 and a half, and more modern humans reducing it all the way down to what we see today, which is 3 to 4%. And that's not enough to be a separate species because Neanderthal was already similar to modern humans at 99.75%. And modern humans today are similar at 99.9%. We only off by 0.1%. And that 0.1% is the changes that happen through these so-called haplogroups. That haplogroup only makes up 0.1%. Anything, that's the sex chromosome. And that develops based off geographical location, based off where people were, was at, where the paternal lineages was at going through the changes. It has nothing to do so you don't find it there. <laughs> So that's not enough to make any group of people on the planet a separate species. 4%, 2%, that's bullshit. How? And you can't say that the white boy today is a Neanderthal because Neanderthal, when he stood 5'3", he was short and he had rickets. You got people in Germany that's down there 7 feet tall with straight legs and straight arms. So how the fuck did he get that damn tall with long necks and shit? And his nasal passage, his nasal bridge, and his nose wasn't even as narrow as modern-day Caucasians. So something's going on and something's wrong when we say things out of context like that. People in China and, and, and certain people in China and Japan have more mongoloid traits than so-called white people. I'm sorry, I said that out of context. People in China and Japan have more Neanderthal traits than so-called white people. You can look into this. Type of people in Asia have more Neanderthal genes than people in Europe. They got more fucking mongoloid. They have more Neanderthal genes and Denisovan in them in Asia. Yeah, and I think the Denisovan... Um Allowed them to breed in those high and high, and, and, and high altitudes and um, and um over there in uh, Himalayas and in Tibet they were able to live in high mountains. The way their oxygen intakes in with their red blood cells, the oxygen levels they can intake, they can live in high altitude better than anybody because they come from a, mon- a real mountainous people. So the real mountain man, a caveman, lives over there in Thailand, who who they were to develop genes they can live in high altitudes that they got from Homo Denisovan. <laughs> So when did this Neanderthal get to um, get to Europe? Well, he left and migrated over there from Homo heredogensis, who who, mi- who migrated out of Africa and went over there. He made it over there. Remember, he left out six hundred thousand years ago. He evolved into the Neander- proto Neanderthal around three hundred thousand years ago. And for three hundred thousand years ago, some of them even crossed bred with Homo ancestor in between to become modern Neanderthals. So when Homo heredogensis leaves out of the continent, six hundred thousand. He started to go through through these different changes in between. Now, we got to understand, 600,000 years ago, Europe wasn't the same Europe that we see today. There was a lot of different environmental shifts that was going on, environmental pressures that was going on. It was a little bit more warmer then. The earth was more, it was more grassy. You had more, it was more, it was more easier, more access, easier to certain resources compared to the different glacier periods that hit before the last glacier period that we went through in the Holocene. Neanderthal. So So when did they get stuck in them ice caps? Well, uh, and what led to the well, the Anatols, the Anatols didn't get stuck in it. They adapted to the different environmental shifts in, in, in northern Europe. Because the first place they found Neanderthal was in um, is in uh, Neanderthal Valley, which is in Germany. That's why they call it that. Neander. And that's why they had uh, high levels of creatine in their skin. Right. They adjusted to it. The modern humans that got stuck near Caucasus areas or in the mountains happened around twenty four thousand years ago. But a lot of them escaped. And you find them escaping through Russia, and they might get through the um, Cro-Magnon caves in France. So, a lot, so that's a whole. That's kind of like mythical, you know. A lot of them kind of escaped. They really, they really didn't. That that's not responsible for them developing white, uh, light skin or white skin. That white skin should develop in Central Asia, way, way after people got caught in ice caps. You get what I'm saying? The white skin happened around six to ten thousand years ago. We're talking about an early. Uh, Mendel Glacier period, which occurred 24,000 years ago. When that Mendel Glacier period hit, that caused all of North Africa to go through drought 
and all of Europe to freeze and fuck up. So the human population kind of went south towards the equatorial zones before the Holocene Glacier period. So a few of people got caught. They really didn't survive. And a lot of them hid out through Central Asia, in the grasslands of Central Asia, with haplogroup IJ. And a lot of some African-American men have this haplogroup I. And that haplogroup I is an offshoot of haplogroup IJ, which exists in, a, in, in, in Central Asia before going into Europe. Cro-Magnum people brought that marker there before going into Cro-Magnum France. And before they lived in France, they were in the Middle East. So the humans that did get caught in ice caps, they really didn't survive. So this whole lighter skin mutation, this happened way after that shit. And that just came from a depletion of resources, not getting proper nutrients and proper enzymes and environmental pressures. And if you don't use it, you lose it. There is no need to have dark, dark skin living in an area where the texture of light is, is ultraviolet aging rays, which is UVA, compared to equatorial UVB. You have to think about what's going on in your skin. Your skin, your natural melanin is a natural sunscreen for us. It defends us against the ultraviolet burn rays. If you're not getting enough defense in certain areas, what happens? If you don't use it, you lose it. It's not needed. The tint, the, the texture of sunlight is much more thinner. So what happens is, is that melanin level, it gets reduced. As it, reduce, as, as it reduces down, you start to find a, a, a vitamin D deficient. And then from the vitamin D deficient, that's just not one thing. In order to adjust to the ultraviolet rays to get the proper vitamin D, you have to reduce the melanin. But as you reduce the melanin, you can absorb more better vitamin D. You decrease in folate. And that folate, which is with that folate, which is being redu- reduced, can affect, you know, you have neural tube defects, which a lot of Europeans have. You have fertility effects, which a lot of them have. So they had to adjust to the type of environment in order for the species of humanity to survive, to go through that mutation. And this happened in Central Asia before even making it into Europe. Uh, the uh, depletion of resources, they wasn't getting the proper nutrients that they was getting in certain equatorial zones, whether they was in tropical Asia or tropical Africa. They wasn't getting none of that shit. They was adjusting to the environment that they were in. So you find a change that occurred in 111 amino acids. And, they, and even before they even developed that change in 111 amino acid, they already had Neanderthal traits. Because they already mixed, remember, they mixed with Neanderthal 45,000 years before that mutation, SLC245, happened. 50,000 years ago is when they mixed with Neanderthal, SLC245 kicked in between 6,000 to 12,000. So that's a 7,000 to 12,000 and a half to an 8,000 year gap. So this shit happened way later when they started to become what you see today. Okay, so we're going to pause right there real quick, getting into the actual breakdown of the genetics and how they're becoming more adjusted to harsher harsh environments. Um, we had a caller. I was about to bring the caller in. Um, so we'll just pause and wait for them to raise their hand again. Caller, if you want to get back in the queue, just raise your hand. I'll bring you on now. Um if you are listening to Timo Size Radio, check us out, TimoSize dot com. Uh what's your what's your link, Amir Kamada? How do you spell that for? A M I R C A M A R A. Amir Kamara. Amir Kamara. It's on Facebook, Facebook dot com forward slash Timo Cyrus. Um Okay, so their 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 genetics are changing due to the environmental pressures. How does that play psychologically? on their evolution of the white race? Oh, well, we have to get into, before we get into the chemical reaction of the gene ADRA2B that we spoke of yesterday, due to them not having the proper resources, due to them having to fight more based off the environment that they've been in, having to become more aggressive, is responsible for the gene the gene to occur with this mutation in their brain. Of course, it affects you psychologically. It makes you more aggressive and more violent. You start to develop this a D R A two B gene, which makes them more have higher levels of uh if you study European when I used to work in a pharmacy, they came in there for more um uh, for more um uh, antidepressant pills and many and antidepressant antidepressant um um pills and shit than anybody. You know, they suffer from the high level of depressions, you know, um you know, at a high rate, yo, anxiety and all types of weird shit. But um, due to them living in those type of environments, it made them become more um, uh, overly more overly more reactive, more aggressive, fight more. They didn't really have shit compared to tropical Africa and tropical Asia. 
You know, these people were had to become more aggressive. So they developed the gene, ADRA two B, which 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 was something that they're that they're more prone to. They they have they lack more affection. They um they they're more colder. They I mean they rather watch a dog die than watch you die. They have you know it's just that's just a fact. A lot of them they feel more sympathy for a dog than they feel for a human because they have a close relationship with that with that creature from the areas that they live in. The first place that the dog was domesticated from the wolf was over there in Central Asia. You can look into this around Central Asia. Some of them, some people are saying China now. So what I'm saying is anyway outside all that crap, but. You know, this gene is responsible for the high levels of depression and, and the coldness and, and the way they act. I mean, if you could, Kufu, we can take a trip down, you know, memory lane off of the, the violent levels or the high levels of murder that they had at the most extreme rate right now in the white. But your pain is so far in, he don't have to murder you extremely like he used to. He extremes you casually now. You know, he, he plays shit all in your environment and in your, in, your, in your community so you can destroy yourself. But he's always but caught what, behind what, it all. What led to that, like... It was scarce food in the environment. Scarce food, cold. cold. It wasn't enough. It wasn't. Enough, it, it, wasn't a, it was. It wasn't enough resources. Cold. Uh, not enough food. A shortage on human population. All types of weird shit went on. All types of shit. So they had to fend for what they had. Study them. Ancient Bosnia. Ancient Russia. You know, ancient Greece. You feel me with with the ancient Macedonians. And I'm not talking about the early Minoans who was half black and we thought they came from out of Africa. You know, in Southern Europe and that part of um, part of, um, of Southern Europe, but even a little bit before that, studying um, you know, ancient Nordic Europe, just studying all the different shit that they was going through and what they was doing to become what they are. So you have the plentiful food, cold weather, lack of resources. Imagine what that do if you're not getting what you feel you need. How would you act? Would you come out of would come out of whatever area peaceful? You taking shit. By the time these niggas come down and they look at tropical Asia and tropical Africa, they see all this shit. I'm not coming down here kindly. I've been fighting all my life in these Nordic Arctic areas. I'm coming down here taking shit. I'm on beach mode. You how many as motherfuckers is peaceful and respectful? Not me. Fuck you. That's what they did. So the places that they attacked first before Africa was Asia. The brown and darker skin regions in Asia. Only a few have made it to North Africa as early as 12,000 years ago. And you start to see them breed with the African men in the Atlas Mountains of Morocco and a few of those women that back migrated in. But those are predominantly women. I'm talking about when the men started taking action coming down on bullshit. The ones that peacefully came through, they made it through. That's the back migration that we talk about. They really didn't have enough uh, uh, power to affect what we already had going on in the continent. When you start to see these early haplogroups groups come in that's from outside of the continent, like the r one b v a eight that a lot of people in Africa have, especially living in Central Africa, you know that shit come from out of Central Asia. It just migrated there. It wasn't enough to affect the environment. Well, call it from the nine eight five. This is Timo Sarge. Did you have a question for the brother? Yeah, peace and love to everyone. This is just a cop by Nepti on PCO. Brother Ngobi, absolutely. You you going in, and I'm telling you, you you really enlightening me right now. I wanted to to say that you are exactly right in regard to that uh, RH positive factor being in a lot of of our people here in America. Because my mom is uh, RH positive, and in fact, you also write about that B antigen because you know what? She lost her first two children. She lost them. Because, right. of, you know, before she was born, she lost her children. So, and I also read that a couple of years ago in this book I had, and I, I held it near, uh, near and dear to me for a long time because of the information that was in there. And I know information changes, you know, as new research comes about. But it was a book by um, a doctor, Ph.D. doctor, uh, Peter E. Volk. And it, the name of the mm-hmm. book was Human Heredity and Birth Defects. And so I knew mm-hmm. that. That's why when you said that, you, it resonated with me because my mm-hmm. mom definitely is RH factor, uh, RH positive, as 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 is a lot of the people in her particular family. And those two, those two different types of people that you said came migrated here into America. You, I, I was trying to catch it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and listen to the show again. Hopefully, the brother Kufu. Um, repost it because there's some stuff I wanted to, you know, I wanted to do a little note taking, but it was something you said, and I'm, and I'm more than sure 
that I think it was uh, in regard to the the, the Mongoloid. You know, so the Mongoloid two different types. You have some in South America, and then you had you know you had some in America. But my great grandfather's eyes are blue. All right, well, people don't believe me when I tell them that. But the thing is, that this is the absolute truth. I can't, you know, there's no, no way for me to change that. You know, but at the end of the day, my great-grandfather, that's my mother's grandfather, who, he has blue eyes. Like, a, you know, blue, blue-eyed blue man. You, you wouldn't even think that he was my grandfather when you look at me and be like, no, 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 no. Yes. Absolutely. So I just wanted to commend you on that, brother. That was um that resonated with me and I appreciate this information. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. I say, sister, peace and love to you. Peace and love. Peace and love. We appreciate you. Absolutely. So that was all so I had. That was all I had. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. No, no, I was saying that was all I had. I didn't want to stop the information okay. because he's actually going in it's, it's, it's so much I just wish I had my notepad with me right now but you will repost this show am I correct about that there'll be a way for me to go back go and listen to this again yes it'll be in the archives alright thank you brother and, and we'll repost it again um, if you have any more questions just feel free to come back in and, um, I'll leave your mic open just mute your mic and you can come back in yeah. if you wanted to add something or ask another question. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, brother. You're welcome. All right. You are now listening to Timo Size Radio. You are on the horizon. We got the foremost runner of the West and the brother Ngozi breaking it down, the origins of the white race. I think we left off where um, how they developed. Right. The now, I want to get to, yeah, the anger, yes. So, you know, again, when we deal with epigenetics, and when I talked about it earlier, when you're dealing with that, epigenetics is environment, it's based off environmental factors, and it switches genes. And sometimes it can make cells hard to um, read how genes is, so you start to see changes occur. So, for example, with her grandfather with the blue eyes, this mutation comes from OCA2, Ocleocutaneous strand 2, which is the second strand of albinism. We have OCA1 and OCA2. OCA2 is responsible for eye change or how eye, how, with the eye color eyes, certain part parts. When you do with the MRC1 or MCR1 gene, that's responsible for different hair color and the way the genes go out in and out autosomally for patterns of skin and different things. But through these eyes, this is OCA2. Now, the thing is, is that if I'm a black man and I have an OCA1 trait and I meet a one with OCA1 trait, it's like sickle cell. I got sickle cell trait. I do have that. If I meet a one with sickle cell trait, it's a large chance that my baby can come out with sickle cell disease. We know the sickle cell affects the red blood cells and the hemoglobin when the, when the red blood cells start to sickle because of lack of oxygen at the base stem of it, something called Q10s. So what happens is, is that when you deal with um, um, this OCA2 trait, Africans had those traits already. It's just that humans that left out of Africa had to go into the right environment in order for that shit to kick off, and they started to meet up. People had blue eyes before they had pale skin. And we know this because they found a, a, a skeleton in Spain, and they said he had blue eyes and dark skin. Everybody on, if you're online listening, type up "blue um, blue eyed dark skin um, dark skin man in Spain 7,000 years ago." Blue eyed skeleton. Blue. He had blue eyes and dark skin. So you can type up "dark skin blue eyes found in Spain 7,000 years ago." I mean, and the, and the thing is that these blue eyes start to kick in at a larger rate. In Central over there in Georgia near the Caucasus. So you had these brown skinned people walking around with blue eyes, or light brown skinned people walking around with blue eyes. And this happened around 10,000 years ago. Compared to the SLC 2485, that happened around 6,000 to 5,000. But we know for a fact that the blue eyed gene kicked in around 10,000. So when these people meet up with each other, they give each other these traits. So then when they give each other these traits, you start to see people with fair skin and blue eyes once they interbreed amongst one another. But these are two different mutations that happen in two different parts or that's responsible for um, two different parts of the body. The larger organism of the human being is the skin. You know what I'm saying? So you have this SLC245 that affects the skin, and you have the OCA2 that affects the eye color. So when these people meet up, they give up to these different, um, these different types of people. But back to the genius responsible for the high levels of depression and the high levels of violence and different things. Yes, it happened based off the environment that they lived in, lack of resources, and they had to fend for everything that they fucking had. 
compared to places that's tropical and got grassland and more resources. You got more time to build love instead of just hating. Even though we did have tribal issues, because I'm not romanticizing humanity or Africa, the part of humanity that we come from, but it wasn't to the extreme compared to the people from the north that really didn't have it. And all they had to do and all they had time for is to build heavy artillery and, 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 and different shit to try to, you know, fight their way out to, to come down and start, you know, taking over shit. And you started to even see this shit with the earliest, the last group of Caucasians that escaped the Caucasus area who made in their Mesopotamia around 2000 B.C. They called the Harians. And the Harians were the ones who taught the so-called Hyksos, which was nothing but Amorites, how to build, how to deal with the wheel. And then it was them which dealt with the wheel, the springs in the wheel that took the chariots and the Kemet. When they came into Kemet around um, 1800 B.C., 3,800 um, years ago. And they started coming in peacefully, piece by piece in Kemet around um, – the end of the 11th dynasty, and they took over in the 15th dynasty until I almost kicked their ass around the 18th dynasty. But they were already learning different things from these last group of Caucasians who came, trans Caucasians who came down from the Caucasus around 2000 BC. They were called Harians. Look into this. This is a fact. So, all of these um, mutations, are they causing neurological disorders? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. Go ahead. Absolutely. No, go ahead. I'm sure, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it do affect function. I mean, when you deal with the ADRA two B, I mean, when you read into that, I don't know if you have an article right now, Kufu, but if you can, I would like for you to read that so people can hear it. You read into it, you can see the effects that it does mentally. Of course, mutations can affect you in different types of ways. Okay, I'm gonna pull that article up and read from it. Um, and that's for everybody out there listening. A D two R A A D A D R A two B. Look into it. A D R A two B. And it's just that this gene predisposes them to think negatively about everything. Like Absolutely. you could be walking down the street and just you just thinking gloomy just, shit. Like the, he, like he the just gloomiest say, shit you could think about. You just focus <laughs> on it all day. Just like the environment, just like the just like the environment they come from. You know, they can just see you walking down the street. They might smile, but in they hear they say fucking nigger. They just can't. They can't be peaceful for real. It's impossible. Even if they, even the nicest ones, I'm not. I'm just saying because you do got a few that's nice. They still got that shit in them. They can't help it, man. You're really dealing with the deficient people or a retarded gene people. These people are retarded genetically. They're they're really a defect, and no human being should look like that. It's kind of like a, a accident through nature. Some parts of the world humans weren't supposed to go in. So now we have to deal with the after effect of it. So you got this downstream that's coming down, this motherfucker. Okay, Brother Melvin, he's always on his job. I was Googling the article, and um, he actually sent it to me, so I appreciate that, brother. Oh, man, that's my uh, brother, man. Peace, Brother Melvin. Don't point. Uh, come into the queue, man, whenever you get ready. I know you there, but... um. The article is called, um, it's titled, Genes Predispose Some People to Focus on the Negative. And it says, uh, some people are genetically pre- genetically predisposed to see the world darkly. According to a study from the laboratory of a researcher now on the faculty of Cornell's College of Human Ecology. Um, it goes on to say, Adam K. Anderson, Associate Professor of Human Development, is continuing his research on emotions, genetics, and perception, which began at his laboratory at the University of Toronto in collaboration with scientists at the University of British Columbia. Their study, published in September in Psychological Science, found a previously known gene variant causing some individuals to perceive emotional events, especially negative ones, more acutely than others. This genetic variation contributes to how emotions bias individuals to see the same world in different ways says Anderson. More than just how we may later remember, these findings suggest genetics influence how our brains pick and choose which events to perceive in the first place. The gene in question is the ADRA2B deletion variant, which influenced the neurotransmitter uh, nori pinephrine. I can't pronounce that word, but I'm going to spell it out for the listeners. It's spelled N-O-R-E-P-I-N-E-P-H-R-I-N-E. And it goes on to say, 
previously found to play a role in the formation of emotional memories, the new study shows that the ADRA2B gene uh, variant also plays a role in real-time perception. Okay, and it goes on to say um, about the study, and then it says uh, these individuals may be more likely to pick out angry faces in the crowd. So, you know, you're walking down the street, they're looking at a black person, you know, they, you know, you could be happy just going about your day. You know, you could just be, you could be listening to some shot or something. They look at you because you dress different. You might have on some, you know, <laughs> you might even be wearing some Perry Ellis. Or you might even have some Tommy Hilfiger on, but just your style, just the way you walk, your swagger, they just seeing it totally different and, you know, react. You know what I'm saying? This is science. Gonna say, this is science. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm just saying, this is science. We're not making this shit up. Go ahead, bro. It goes on to say, um, outdoors, they might notice potential hazards. Places you could slip, loose rocks that might fall, instead of seeing the natural beauty. Like, yo. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look. Could, hey, Kufu, could you read the part um, that's responded where it says the, the population or the group of people that have it at the highest rate? I'm going down to it. The findings shed new light on ways in which genetics, combined with other factors such as education, culture, and moods, can affect individual differences in emotional perception and human subjectivity, the researchers say. Um, further work on this topic in, um, in Anderson's laboratories intends to examine whether individuals with the same uh, genetic variants, depending on their environment and stage of development, can uh, change or enhance perception of the positive rather than the negative this article actually isn't the one um that has that but you can build on that i'm gonna pull that actual article up that you're looking for which one i mean just go ahead and build on um the article but i'm gonna pull the exact um oh yeah the adr the adr a2b i'm gonna pull, I'm gonna pull the other article that has that information in it yeah, yeah. Well, it's like you stated. You, you read it. It's, it's really responsible for how they view the world, how they view the world around them. Um, they they don't see shit the way you see it. They, they will never understand how you see shit. It's hard to even try to equate uh, uh, equate how you feel with them. It. It's impossible. You can't do it. These people are just like this happens with their cousins in Arabia. It happens with their Persian cousins. They don't see shit the same, and that's why everywhere you go. You are under attack for no reason because you're dealing with a bunch of sick ass people, and they just can't see the world peacefully. Um, and I, and it's, it's not funny. It's, it's sad. You're dealing with a pathetic race. Seriously. Okay, here a, we go. Got a it. pathetic not race, but a pathetic group or breed of humanity. Right. <laughs> okay, I got the article. Um, it says uh, further research is planned to explore this phenomenon across ethnic groups. While more than half of Caucasians are believed to have the ADRA2B gene variants. Statistics suggest, uh, hold on. Uh, statistics suggest it is significantly less prevalent in other ethnic ethnicities. For example, a recent study found that only 10% of Rwandans had the ADRA2B gene variant. So there you go. And, and, and that's due to the Rwandan people being prone to war, you know. So, uh, and then different things that they went through, which le allowed them to have it. So that's less than 10 percent compared to the the other ethnic group that we know. It's Europeans. They got it at a higher rate, and they had it a longer time period. You know, but now you find a few African Americans that have it due to the environment, the environmental pressures that we go through. You know, we can get violent as well, but again, it's more prevalent amongst the Europeans. Uh -huh. So yeah, so now I mean we, I mean the evidence is out there. It's not like we're just making this stuff up. This is actually their science. They're telling you that they're genetically recessive, uh, which uh, the late great Dr. Francis Cress Wilson stated a long time ago. So now what we're doing, we're just improving on that by adding the other research to it and showing that it's more scientific than Afrocentric. Correct, correct. I mean, this a lot of this stuff is a fact. Even the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I mean, I don't believe it all, his, you know, the, the Yakub and all that shit, but when he gave that time frame with a the pale skin and uh, the, the grafting of the genes and all that, I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's the mythology is bullshit, but the 6,000 year gap, SLC 245, I don't know if you guys can pull that up, uh, Melvin or uh, Khufu, it says that the shit is 6,000 to 12,000 years old. It's a fact. So what we're seeing on the planet is a, a, new, a new mutation. 
Nobody should be looking like that. Human beings shouldn't even have blue eyes. You shouldn't. Huh. It's a defect. And when you start to look into OCA2 and HARC2, HERC2, and you look at OCA2, you start to see why. You shouldn't have it. It's a deficiency going on. Certain enzymes are not moving the way it's supposed to move, or you lack enzymes in this area. So this deficiency starts to happen. You know, it's lacking something. <laughs> so you start to have it diminish, or it goes through depletion, and you start to form these different mutations. A mutation can either add on or subtract. Some mutations you can develop to be more beneficial for you to survive more better. For example, Africans developed benign sickle cell benign. It helped us fight on malaria. We developed that. But when you're outside of Africa with sickle cell, it's fucked up. People with sickle cell go through all types of disorders. But if you're in Africa where you have these, uh, these different mosquitoes, it helps you fight on malaria. You also have mutations that's responsible for allowing you to uh, do a whole lot of stuff that, can, that could be beneficial. So when you deal with a mutation, I'm um, cool if you could look up the word mutation. It, 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 it can either be add on or subtract. And with these people, it's subtracted. They lost a lot of shit because it wasn't beneficial to the area that they lived in. And they bring their half, they, they half, they halfway ass down with these deficiencies. And they try to contaminate everybody else with it through violence, war, and through rape. And everything else. Uh -huh. Dealing with the deficient people. And but the Ngozi, um, um, I have an aunt. She's actually, her, her skin is, her pig, she's losing her pigmentation. She's losing pigmentation in both of her legs, her arms, around mm -hmm. her mouth, her mm -hmm. face, her neck. You know, this is the same aunt who, you know, the great grandfather, my great grandfather has the OCA too. You know, so she, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it explains a whole lot of people, especially on my mother's side of the family, it explains a whole lot about everything with them. She's the only one who I see has have this new, uh, this, this, um, changing of her skin, the pigmentation, but all of them have this this grayish eye color, you know, every single mm. one of, I mean, all, mostly all of them, all of their eyes are not brown, you know, not like mine, <laughs> what I'm saying is their eyes are gray, if they're not gray, they're real light hazel, Yeah, you know? they went through, um, your family members went through a lot of, I'm sure, and I'm, I mean, and it's not to be, and it's happened with a few of my relatives. <laughs> They, right. they mix with a lot of Europeans. I mean, it mix with a lot Absolutely. of Europeans. I mean, if you, if your, uh -huh. Uh -huh. if your grandfather, if your grandfather, if you got, a, if your grandfather had a son and he's still around, and I guarantee you, if you had him to take a DNA test through AncestryDNA.com or 23andMe, uh -huh. his wife uh -huh. might not, might not, might not even go back to Africa. Might go back to, you know, Europe. Uh -huh. Some people, yeah, some people right. that got these European paternal lineages. It's so far back that today the people look black, so they they still eighty percent, ninety percent sub-Saharan African. But I'm saying your mutations and um, uh, mutations that that we see going on was a little bit more recent compared to people that went through it mm -hmm. five hundred years ago. Yours probably happened around a hundred years ago with your grandfather, right. great grandfather. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And he gave yeah. those traits to his children. You know? Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Every single one of them. You were blessed because. <laughs> I was gonna say you yeah, were black because they they found some black some, they found some black women and and, and that black and that melanated <laughs> well, not melanated but that those equatorial genes <laughs> kind of saved it and <laughs> reduced that yeah, shit down from you. Yeah. <laughs> you know absolutely, absolutely. Because my daughter is definitely you know, but absolutely he, he um he has one son living. That's my uncle um Willie when they used to use all those names Willie B and things like that, but. He has one son living, you know, and I'm going to talk to him a lot, but uh, the whole family on that side is, is so much, so much wickedness. You were talking about um, just a second ago about how they're, you know, filled with a lot of chaos and disorder. That I see that on my mother's side of the family. It is absolutely so prevalent, you know. So thank, I thank you for this, brother. This is uplifting. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sister. And I'm going to tell you something, man. A lot of these traits that a lot of us have, you know, it's responsible for a lot of the way we function. You know, some of those mm -hmm. European genes could be responsible for how your gallbladder function or how your kidneys function or the way your pancreas function. You know, we found out now that uh, Neanderthal, the due to human beings mixed with Neanderthal, is it's, 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 it's responsible for people catching type 2 diabetes type, and being born with type 1 diabetes and lupus. Lupus mm -hmm. is an autoimmunity disorder. You know, a lot of shit that we inherited from breeding with these people in the transatlantic slave trade. 
you know, people, you know, and, and not all, but a lot of families that's of African American, you have child molestation and shit going on, an uncle that touched somebody or a cousin and shit. This shit is what they developed that they that they that they did in sex farming, and we bring those traits down in today's time. So the domestication brother, that the African American went through today is fucked up. Yes, indeed. Go ahead. Yes, and uh, brother Ngozi, you are you are straight on. You are on, my cousin. Um, that is uh, her father. Who I'm telling you is the father is the child, the son of my grandfather with the blue eyes. His daughter, she she died from lupus three years ago on Christmas Day. She has lupus. We just yeah, recently yeah. found yeah. out. We just recently found out three months ago that my sister has the the cousin. Um, uh, well, you would say the cousin to lupus, uh, fibromyalgia, uh, something to that effect. So, mm-hmm. and arthritis mm-hmm. is very prevalent in the, my family on my mother's side. Hypertension and things mm-hmm. like that, definitely. But when it comes down to these different defects, I saw it so much on my. I feel so. I feel so blessed. You know, I really do. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you are blessed. You are blessed. Yeah. You are blessed. Yes, I do. And 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 and, 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 and this is the whole thing. And Kufu, if you can, brother. Kufu, are you there? Yes, sir. Uh, Kufu, is there a way that you can pull up the article to show and prove what we're saying about how SLC? No, 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 not SLC, not SLC, but when humans mixed with Neanderthal, that's responsible for diabetes and lupus and all that. How Neanderthal genes mm-hmm. affect uh, affect people. Uh, I type up Neanderthal if you can type up Neanderthal genes is responsible for diabetes and it, it, it should some, something should come up on it to talk about lupuses and all the other things so yeah man a lot of these traits see these people are and I'm not trying to be funny I mean this shit these people are deficient and they are deformed you know they can walk around and mm-hmm. like they normal or they won't but they fucked up and when people yeah, agree with these them are, these are three basic features of a mutant human Edilocus Ectoplasm and receptor. Mm-hmm. You want to explain that Edolocus? Well, Edolocus, Ectoplasm and receptor is what a lot of those Far East Asians have with that jet black, thick, straight hair. Compared to uh, Caucasians, they have that soft, straight hair due to to retain heat to keep the body warm. So it's, a, it's it is a defect in the locus area that's responsible for the hair, Ectoplasm and receptor. But a lot of the Far East Asians have it at a more higher rate because they got that jet, that thick, jet black, straight hair, thick, straight hair. That's <laughs> fucked up. Which is another deficiency. OCA two A. Go ahead, Kufu. Yeah, OCA. I mean, these are the three. This is something you can just look at a person and just know that they got. They're mutants. They got so many mutations, and you might not want to breed with them. No, Edilocus. you want to stay away from them. Yeah, Edilocus, uh SLC two A five, and um, SLC two Yeah, and Edilocus. Yeah, SLC and Edilocus. And not to mention, you want to talk about the expiration date that SLC four five. Oh yeah. And yeah, yeah, know yeah. About it, they yeah, yeah. We, on it. yeah, we can nature with that shit is checking out. Yeah, every well, there's an expiration date on that. That SLC two forty five, when they're going down into the gene variants, they're finding out that it's uh, it's it, it's it, it, it expires because it's not normal for people to look like that. It is a defect. It is a it is a defect. It is a, uh, a, a accident. You know, it, it's it's not supposed to happen. A proper human being. It's supposed to look like the nerd people in Sudan or the Dinka. Uh, this is what a proper human look like. Long limb proportions, tropical limb proportions, you know. This is what a human being is supposed to look like, you know, compared to people leaving out. You can also be brown skin, light brown skin. This is for all of us light brown skin people. You should look like that, like the Koi San and different groups. You should look like that. But these other motherfuckers, these downstreams, you should look like that. Even with these, you know, the people that we make fun of, or the, the, you see all the defects happening in India. The eco zone in India is fucked up. People being born with six arms, six legs, you know, straight hair, all this type of fucked up shit. A lot of crazy shit going on. And I got that article, um, thanks to Brother Melvin. Uh, yes. It is, it is labeled, uh, Neanderthal's DNA legacy linked to modern ailments. Uh, he there you go. Inherited, inherited variants affecting disease risk infertility yeah. number one we see the infertility rate that actually death rate is higher than their birth rate and actually actually their children are becoming a minority in america like it's everywhere like right children even in europe so i'm just saying yeah even in europe but for they just, i mean their children are a minority white children are a minority at this point you know what i'm saying you get, but you have an older population of european americans so we see the infer- infertility rate, skin, 
and hair characteristics. The article goes on to say, remnants of Neanderthal DNA in modern humans are associated with genes affecting type 2 diabetes, Crohn's disease, lupus, uh, bilary, uh, uh, cirrhosis, uh, uh, behavior. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They also cystic, cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis. That's the long condition. Cystic oh, okay. fibrosis. They also, con- they also mm-hmm. concentrate in genes that influence skin, hair characteristics. Uh, at the same time, the Neanderthal DNA is conspic- conspicuously low in regions of the X chromosome and testes uh, specific genes. But we also know that damn tail on that uh, on that Y chromosome is falling off as well. You want to get into that too as well. Yeah, and the, and the thing when you talk about the, with the expiration date, they've seen it at the telomeres and the telomeres level, the way it affects um, certain populations with the SLC 2485. And we know anything about telomeres, this is the life length or timeline of an organism, and all organisms have it. So look into that and see what's going on. Go ahead, brother. You are listening to Timo Size Radio, and uh, you're on the horizon with Timo Size, calling from the 336. The line is open. Peace. Peace, peace. This is Brother Melvin. This is Tamerlan. Listen in. What's up, Melvin? Peace, bro. Peace. What's going on in Gozi? Peace, brother. Yeah, man. Thank you for support, man. Oh, yeah. No problem. No problem. I appreciate you, Brother Melvin, for everything. All right? I appreciate you, brother. Thanks, sister. Appreciate you, too. Brother Kansu, you still there? You got anything you want to add on um, before we get into uh, some more information? Uh, man, you know, really, I'm, I'm just intently listening, man. Everything that I'm, I'm possibly uh, found, one of found on the road is hitting on point to point. So, you know, I'm just well, enjoying the flow, man. Yeah. Okay, I brother see. Brother Ngozi, um, brother, brother Ngozi is one of those heavy hitters, you know? He brings the information. I mean, when you're listening, be ready to, you know, prepare yourself to really take it in. And, you know, he, he has his way about it, the way he put that information out there. And, you know, the average person, well, if they're average like me, they can, they can keep up, you know? But at the same time, you have people that and be like, oh, man, he goes so fast because I've, 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 I've sent a lot of his, his information to people. They'd be like, I was trying to keep up. I was trying to keep up. Get your notepad, get your pen, like, you know, jot down those references, go back, research them. You ain't got to just be able to just keep up, just, you know, study. That's what it's about anyway, right? <laughs> study. That's right. It's all about studying. It's all about studying, sister. I'm also one of the most hated right. people don't like me either. So it's all love. Well, well, not me. Not me. I've been loving you from day one. I mean, the information was real. I used, to sit, I, I used to sit back and say, um, I, I wonder if I could get, I wonder if there's a way for the, in, uh, Brother Ngozi um, to go into a lecture, so to speak, not so much a debate, but a lecture, so to speak, with uh, Brother Muhammad, uh, Ali Muhammad. But then I realized you know, that would be kind of, it wouldn't be progressive in a way because really and truly your information is so much more solid to me. Not to put y'all, you know, not to try to, you know, use variance, but I'm just saying your information, the way you put that information out there is so much, it's simpler for me, you know? So I like that. And that's what I'm here to do. That's what I'm here to do. I'm, you know, I, you know we want, we want okay, people to think. Real quick. Go ahead, brother, get in there. To all the callers that are listening, um, Online or via any one of your devices, um, call in. The number is three two three eight seven zero four six three four to continue to listen to the show because it will not be available through devices um, or online. Ever. Wow, always go crazy. Yeah, so just call in 323-870-4634. Uh, the switchboard got some ghosts in it, but uh, it is what it is. <laughs> we got a slew of callers. Yeah. Your callers, if you want to get into the conversation, you got a question for the brother, just press 1. I think I hear Shesmo in the background. Shesmo, I hear you in the background. Is that you? No, no, that's not me. I thought it was the brother. 
Okay, okay. Well, so I, you, you, I know you had some questions earlier. You still have, you still have uh, some questions or comments? Yeah, I'm gonna chime in a little bit. Um, keep, keep going in. Um, I'm chilling right now. Okay, that's cool. So you're listening to Timo Size Radio. We got the foremost runner, the Westerners. Uh, our good brother was here in Gozi. And uh, he's breaking down the origin of the right, the white race, how they became um, mutants, you know, how they <laughs> <laughs> how they fell off genetically. And, yeah, they you know, fell off, what man. They, what they couldn't do genetically, they try to, you know, artificially do. So now, you know, they put us into these artificial societies. You know what I'm saying? They came up out of them caves, came up out of that environment, <laughs> basically conquered the world. You know what I'm saying? They had a drive. I mean, I can't knock their drive, though. You know what I'm saying? Because we, we need to look at some of the things that they're doing and get some of that will and some of that drive back into us so we can resurrect uh-huh. our genetic memory and get back uh-huh. into our proper places. Because if you look at all kingdoms, all species, there's a ranking system. You know what I mean? And we, we're not what we're supposed to be. Genetically, we're supposed to be on top. We're supposed to be ruling the world. You know what I'm saying? We're supposed to be uh-huh. ruling... At least the whole continent of Africa, like period. This world, this world is supposed to be ruled by brown and black people. Well, what I mean by brown and black is dark brown and brown people. They should rule. Mm-hmm. These people that we see that's coming from these Nordic areas are defects. They're deficiencies. They shouldn't rule shit. And we see what's going on with the planet, and and, and they, these motherfuckers destroy ecosystems, man. They destroy ecosystems. Mm-hmm. You know. And it's like for some reason I don't know if they're doing it subconsciously But I mean they, they are doing it objectively But subconsciously I really believe that they're trying to Turn people to to Turn everybody into them You know the way they mix their blood with you the, the, All these damn buildings that block the sun And everybody's vitamin D deficient It's all types of shit that's going uh-huh. on Even people here living in North America Black people we struggle in the winter A lot of us are, are anemic and, and that's why we act a damn fool when we see our father raw. When we see our father raw in the summertime, we don't know how to act. We want to take our motherfucking shirts off. We want to run around. Like, woo, yeah, so happy, you know what I'm saying? But in the wintertime, we all fucked yeah. up, you know what I'm saying? We got, yeah. we got, yeah. we anemic, we, you know, we can't take the cold weather, we shit, all this type of shit, vitamin D deficient, all types of shit, the folate is all fucked up, you know? Well, mm-hmm. vitamin D is high, the vitamin D is low, but our folate is high. A lot of our children, we're born with rickets and shit. That's a fucked up right. That's a fucked up demonstration of situation right there. So it's like for some reason it's like they're trying to turn you into them. You know, the the mentality right. that our brothers got, you know, in the hood, they got this shit from the European. The European is the original thug. Study ancient Bosnia. Study goddamn in Germany. Study England and see how these motherfuckers act in the original ghetto. The original ghetto comes from Germany, the gutter. Study it. Study what's going on. This shit is not new. You know what I'm saying? Now they're more organized with their criminal activity. So now that they're the ones that has the real organized crime. They can get away with hurting you and they kill you casually now. They got medications and shit that help you in one or it helps one organ but it destroys another. That's why they call it practicing medicine. Yeah, as an experiment. You know, it can help your kidneys but at the same time it can destroy your liver. All types of shit. You taking blood pressure pills, but why are you taking blood pressure pills that's affecting your goddamn liver? Or you taking some of for cholesterol. Why you taking some of acid for cholesterol is affecting your kidneys. Now you get you took this shit for twelve years straight. Now you wonder why I'm on dialysis. I never drunk before, but why I'm on dialysis? Because you were taking the fat. It's fucked up, so they kill you casually and peacefully now. You know, or the or the AZT pills that's responsible for keeping up the immunity levels, or the T cells for people that have HIV. You know, it, it keeps you alive. The steroids that they put in it, but at the same time, what is it affecting? Now, now you got a now you got a, a, a slight slight kidney failure. All types of weird shit. So what I'm saying is that it's, I mean, don't get it twisted. Medication can be beneficial. I'm not telling people not to take that medicine to keep you around long enough. But you have to learn to see the shit that you're taking and try to weigh yourself off of it with natural remedies and natural herbs. But in between, I'm just trying to let you know there's a lot of crazy shit that's going on. The vaccinations that they give kids, it affects them how they function mentally. All types of shit. You, we have to read the shit that they're putting inside of this. When I used to be a pharmacy technician, I had to remember 200 medications. And, I, you know, I don't want to talk about the history of that because a few people that know me personally know what happened in between. But what I'm saying is that you have to be careful with these individuals, you know. So they should be ruling a motherfucking thing. This, this world belongs to brown and black people. I see. And uh, with that, we're going to uh, 
take a call a caller from the 646 you're now in tune with Timo Size Radio peace peace um this is Anukis of Kemet um I came in a little late but uh, as I've been listening for the last almost hour I do have a question about um taking DNA tests I've actually taken um, you, you've actually mentioned the company that you do the best from, 23andMe and Ancestry. Mm-hmm. Um, 23andMe so that I have 1.1% me in the soil DNA. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, 17%, 17% European DNA, um, and 76% Sub-Saharan African. My... Congru- What's your mighty country? I'm going to go to that grade. Um, your MT? Is, yeah, the MT is L3F1B. Oh, you're from and, Congratulations. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, Milani. And my mm-hmm. brother, because I, I wanted to find out my father's lineage, and he is A. Who, who, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Your brother's an A marker? He's an A marker. Oh, wow. So, hold on. Your brother so is I'm, I'm, on PDA. I'm I'm looking mm-hmm. to get more information, especially on my father's lineage, because it is mm-hmm. so real. And uh, all the reading that I do up on it, I know it's sand um, people. It also <laughs> the says nurse, um, Ethiopian and Somalian. A few Somalians, a few Ethiopians, the nerd people in Sudan, the Dinka. The uh, Mercy, the Summer, a lot of these groups have that A marker, and that's a, 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 a that's an old original marker. It comes from Nilo Saharan people, uh, the Neolithic speakers that gave rise. That's an amazing thing. You know, most of our ancestors were Niger Kadopian speakers. You know, we come from the Niger Congo people. We come from Southwest and Central Africa. Uh, only a few were Bantu speakers, but the Bantu speakers are also Niger Congo, like the Bimaliki. They came from Cameroon. A few of them were snatched. Most of our ancestors in Dinka coming from Ivory Coast, the Mindy, like uh, Ivory Coast, uh, Senegambia, Sierra Leone, and early Liberia. A lot of those were Mandinkas. A lot of us were Yor- Yoruba, which is referred to as voltage Congo speakers. And then you have the Alakic Congo speakers in Ghana, which was a Khan. So all our ancestors were predominantly Niger Kadopian people. If your father and brother have an A marker, they come from Nilo Saharan speaking people. So it's a possibility that your people would snatch. Because that's amazing. I'm just, I'm sorry, I cut you off. I don't know if you have any more questions, but I'll go into further detail about that. Go ahead, sister. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm listening to you because I, I'm really trying to find, I know it's very old. It's very rare for African American yeah, yeah. men to have, have that market. market. Right. Yes. So I'm just trying to find out and, more and, information on that. A, a, a few men that have that A marker are a few Mandinka that lived in Mali and a few of the Shanghai people. Shanghai people, um, of the Shanghai people that live in Mali were responsible for building the Shanghai um, University. They were, they're were nilo saharan speakers, and a few of them have it. Now, these nilo saharan speakers, they gave rise to the niger Kadofian language. What happened was around uh, 10,000 years ago, a lot of our um, ancestors, from Niger, there was Niger Saharan speaking people migrated towards Niger, came from the Kodofin area of Sudan, which is upper Egypt. And we migrate out of Kodofin, we go into West Africa and we meet up with the Adamawa groups or the Proto Adamawa groups, which is also another cluster of Nilo Saharan speakers because all the Nilo Saharan comes from the Neolithic languages. But anyway, when we migrate, we go into the, the Niger Congo area. And the Niger Congo area is around Cameroon in Central Africa. And in these areas, we start to sprout out to these different niger Kadofian languages because we brought the Kadofian culture and the Kadofian language from Kodofin in Sudan over there. So we start to amalgamate amongst them. But majority of these men were capital E. 
The only thing that was in West Africa before the E marker came from East Africa was a few A markers. And a lot of the Mbuti pygmies have it in rainforests is a Cameroon. A lot of um 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 a few of the people in um um uh, Angola can have it. And a few people that live all the way down from the south of Nigeria and Nigeria land have it. So before E markers even made it to West Africa, A was already populating all of Africa at a high rate. It's kind of like it was a, when E came in, it's something called a, a downstream that happens. You know, uh, the downstream having a bottleneck. A bottleneck is a reduction of a population. These E markers, which is the E1B1A, who went west, kind of populated all of West Africa. And, and kind of all the A markers that was ringing around kind of like died out. So your, your father and your brother might be the remnants of those populations that still kind of survived and camouflaged amongst the E markers. Okay. And I'm sure they probably was Mandinka coming from Senegambia. Okay, well, thank you for that information. Oh, because I, yes, I was very, I was very confused because I I hear a lot of African Americans. You know, we they say they're E B one, and I'm like, mm-hmm. well, what happened? How how is my brother A? Where did that come from? That that's very strange. Mm-hmm. That that A marker was lingering around West Africa for a long time. It was lingering around before the pyramids in Egypt exist. You know that shit because you know people have been populating in West Africa. At one point they was in North Africa, but when that Mendel Glacier period kicked in, forty forty thousand years ago they were there. When the Mendel Glacier period kicked in, they went south into the rainforest. So these were the Adamawa groups. Later on, you start seeing the Caption period when these E's start to disperse back in. When they come in, a lot of the A's that was around the rainforest is kind of like. The E start breeding with a lot of the women with L2 and L1. You know, my marker and your marker, we got the same mama. Me and you got the same mama. You Fulani, L3, F1, B1. We got the same mama. She kind of came in a little bit later after the E3 B. (laughs) So it's an amazing thing. So uh, I think your father and your mother, your father and your brother, they marker kind of camouflaged amongst the E's that they was around and kind of survived compared to the other A market that died out. And the rest of the A's, the rest of the A's stayed in either South Africa or East Africa, like the Nur and the Simmer and the Mercy of Southern Ethiopia, a few of the Oromo, uh, 12 to 15% of the Somalian population, and um, mostly the Khoisan got it. The Khoisan. Now, my father, when I look at him, because when I was a young girl, people used to ask me, um, am I Asian? Am I Chinese? Now I'm very mm-hmm. dark, <laughs> and mm-hmm. I would say no. But when now that I look at my father, I could see the sand, the sand core people. Yeah. I see it in him. See the, see, the thing is with the original human beings, Homo sapiens sapiens, when we when our species developed, they look like koi sand, proto capoid. They call them proto capoid. These proto capoid people look like Holy Sam, but they were darker. They were, they were, they, they, you ever seen a, it's hard to explain it, but they were darker. See, even the Holy Sam went through a, a mutation when they went into South Africa, because South Africa in that Kalahari desert that they live in is cool, it get cool at night. So even them before the, see, you have to understand the history of the Holy Sam. If you go into Blumos, Blumos Cave 90,000 years ago, it was, there was like in that cave 90,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, and Blumos Cave down there. A pinnacle point. But the people that were down there were called the sand people. This is before the Koi Koi came from up north and met up with them. Later on, they become Koi sand. So anyway, the proto capoid humans, which was the original people, they looked like Koi sand, but it was much darker. So when the Koi sand go into zone two, which is South Africa, not zone one, even out of those equatorial zones, they developed a little lighter skin. So they got the lighter brown skin. It wasn't it wasn't the same type of extreme that, that people caught with SLC two forty five. It's just that they got a little lighter because of the climate. I and mean, even darker skin people get lighter in the winter. You know. So due to them staying down there for so long, it's a natural a natural healthy way of lightening up the skin. Not the shit that people went through outside of Africa. So with original humans, if you got slanted eyes and dark skin, you probably look like what original Homo sapiens sapiens looks like. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, when I was much younger, people used to always ask me. I was like, "Why are they asking me that? My eyes, I don't, I don't feel like I look like I'm Asian." But now yeah. that I, you know, my father's passed on, he transitioned, but I now I see it. Since I've had mm-hmm. this test, mm-hmm. I'm just doing a lot mm-hmm. of research. 
and I and I'm so glad I brought this show tonight to um you know ask mm-hmm. you your opinion on that and and you know now I know search more. Well, congratulations to your sister, and I'm happy for you. And your your father and your brother definitely come from a good ancient lineage, paternally. <laughs> the E-Martyrs kind of hijacked our rainforest, which is bogus. But you guys, the A's was there first. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Peace, brother. All right, Queen. You have a good one. Peace. You too. Thank you for calling in. Uh any other callers press one we'll bring you in if you have any questions comments um you are now rocking with team osiris radio we are on the horizon and at any given moment we can hit that double horizon and go raha rockety you know what i mean so yeah it's a great show it's a good build up you got you got anything else you want to drop on or, or you want to go further into some things or or, or what where, where you at right now I mean, man, I think that it, this was a great show and it was amazing. I want people to understand that evolution is not a straight line. It's, you know, something like a zigzag zig or a braid, as you talked about yesterday, a, a braid of water or a braid flow of water. It's not a straight line. You have natural selection and sexual selection and pressure and environmental pressure that goes on in between. So we have to be in the right environment. Make sure you get the right nutrients. Get the proper enzymes. Check your levels of calcium. Check your levels of um uh, the, the get levels to keep those those amino acids up and healthy because you don't want to go through a downstream that goes on in between your body. You know when you start talking about this SLC two forty five, it's just not salute carrier family twenty four, but we're talking about sodium potassium calcium exchanger number five, which is a downstream at those levels. You know it's, it's a downstream. It's lacking certain the proper enzymes that it needs. You want to make sure you eat the proper food and get the proper nutrients and the proper enzymes and be in a proper environment. The environment affects us. If you stay in the house for four days, what do you catch? You get depressed and catch cabin uh-huh. fever. Makes you feel bad. Uh-huh. Got to get the proper sunlight. Uh-huh. Got to get sunlight. Got to get air. Enjoy your life. Make sure you reduce your levels of stress by not focusing on things that's negative. Because all that shit affects the organism. The organism has to be in the right temperature to experience the proper life. So you want to get the proper temperature... Make sure you get the proper food. And this is just a solution for people. And stop worrying about shit you can't control. Make the best out of this existence that we have. Because existence is divinity. That's a fact. Brother and go. Uh, Brother, yes, sir. I want to ask, <clears throat> want to ask you your opinion on uh, one, one more thing. Because I know that um, you're in the um, pharmaceutical, uh, I guess you could say, industry or, or profession. Um, individuals with allergies. Uh, whether it be dust or, or, or tree or, you know, grass, tree, pollen, um, and then taking these med- medications to, uh, I guess, to do or decide the, the effect of symptoms. What is your opinion on allergies, um, mutations of, of allergies, and then um, how we uh, how we pull out? Well, 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 a lot of the medications for allergies, they don't do nothing but leave back, backed up mucus and the side of the body anyway. And it affects, I mean, it, don't get it twisted, it works. I mean, when you need allergy medicine, it can work and make it go away, but it won't heal it. You know, allergies, uh, if, if Kufu or Melvin can send an article now, I got the article to back it, and I'm glad you brought it up. Allergies is from the Neanderthal ancestry. Neanderthal is responsible for our allergies, <laughs> that trait. Um, <laughs> the best way to do it again, brother. <laughs> The best way to do it again, brother, is make sure you get the right, be in the right environment, right, get the right nutrients, make sure you eat plenty of fruits, and it's really based off your diet and how you work out and how you keep your body going. You know, dust do affect you. You're more sensitive to it. When you're dealing with allergy, that means that the, the, that part of your body, if, the, if you get around dust or bugs or different things, it's a sensitivity going on, and you start to get agitated. Your eyes get watery, your nose run, all types of shit. You shouldn't, you know, it's, it's a weakness going on there. Again, it's another deficiency. So in order to restore that, the medication can only make it go away for a little while. The proper, proper thing to do is make sure you get the proper water, proper fruit, and make sure you're in the right temperature. Or go go back to uh, the proper environment with the right temperature. You feel me? I know you live in Atlanta. It's kind of hot there. But y'all water got so much shit and it's affecting the men's behavior out there. And you know what I'm talking about. So it's a lot of crazy <laughs> shit going on. <laughs> so, you know. Now, I'm a, um, Kufu, if you can, 
could you bring up the article of allergies from uh, Neanderthal traits or Neanderthal, Neanderthal genes is responsible for humans' allergies today? Could you find that? Yeah, I got it. Uh, oh, yeah. Do you want me to say it, too? Oh, you got it? Yeah, yeah, Mel, yeah, Mel, if you can, I don't know if you can read it or a Khufu can read it, but can one of you brothers read it? Who in front of the computer? You got it in cool. front of you, uh, Brother Melvin? Yeah, hey, you want me to read the same line that you read yeah. the, the first paragraph? Yeah, yeah send it to Kufu if you can. All right. Yeah, first paragraph pretty much says, uh, Remnants of Neanderthal DNA in modern humans associated with genes affecting type 2, di- type 2 diabetes, cross disease, lupus, biliary cirrhosis, smoking behavior. They also concentrate in genes that include skin and hair characteristics. At the same time, the Neanderthal DNA is conspicuously low in regions of the X chromosome and ST-specific genes. Right. You want me to keep going? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Did you want me to keep right, going? I'm read the article. Um, All right. um, it, I have the other article. It says uh, humans breeding with Neanderthals created allergies. Um, that's the name of the article. And it says uh, breeding with Neanderthals could be responsible for allergies on modern humans. So, Yeah, s- send me that. Send that's me pretty that. much the article we were talking about. Okay, I'll send that to you as well. And I'm... Um, um, I'm going to read another article. And this article is stating that um, it says, uh, this is by the Santa Fe Institute. It says, indigenous society's first contact typically brings collapse. Indigenous society's first contact with Europeans typically brings collapse. So so basically the article is just going, going off how like you know, all it, how indigenous people around the world, their first contact with Europeans usually brings about the collapse of their societies, either through um, violence or disease, um, which some are not, you know, capable of rebounding from. Like, yeah, tribes in Brazil, you got indigenous tribes all around the planet that go extinct when they come in contact with Europeans or the, Aust- or the tribes from Australia. A lot of those people went extinct. Um, when they when they came into contact with these Europeans as well, and, uh, and we could even go over some of the numbers uh, if you want to go through some of the numbers of the uh, the murder rates. I think uh, Facebook, <laughs> my fault. World War One, you know, they totaling it up to maybe thirty eight million deaths from just that war. World War Two. I think the deaths was deaths in at least sixty million. Um, the Civil War, they trying to total that up to like a million murders. Um, the murders uh, brought by violence and uh, disease when uh, when the Spaniards came to the uh, Americas is at like five hundred million. Okay, um, yeah, I'm I'm okay, I'm hold on. Another article real quick. I'm gonna bring that right back in. Okay, is Shimsu on here now? Yeah, he's still on here. Okay, am I, are we on live right now? Is my phone dropped? Yeah, we on. Okay, yeah, what I was gonna say, Shimsu, is that when you read the article, you have to be careful with allergies, man, because again, um, I'm gonna read that article again. I got it right here for you. Okay, cool. I just want to say, these murder, these murder rates real quick. I just got one more. Um, okay. I was talking about the murder rates of when indigenous tribes come in contact with Europeans, they're either murdered by violence or by disease. And um, I went through a few of them. So right now I'm at the American Revolution. They're talking about um, uh, close to a few hundred thousand people dead. Uh, we deal with the Congolese. Um, you know, that number is kind of sketchy. You know, they try to say 15 million. Some say as high as 40 million. Uh, you deal with the American slave or the transatlantic slave trade. They try to put a nice number of, you know, around 20 million. Um, 
And so um, you could just see the murder rate. The murder rate of the, the uh, these people are over a billion people. Correct. Over right. a billion people. We could. That's just. That's easy. When we say a billion, that's being nice. Right. So, so they're serial killers in an organized manner. I mean, they so fucking brutal now. They can destroy you in an organized manner. It's just that they're serial. They're extremists. The first serial killers, H. A. Holmes. He lived in Chicago. I mean, before that, they were serial killers. But I'm just saying, it, this is nothing to them. They have over a billion on the on the body count. It ain't nothing that a nigga can do in Chicago that can compare to them motherfuckers. Nothing. It ain't nothing that a nigga can do in Chicago or any other part of the world that can compare to what they did at the death rate level, period. But go ahead, Kufu. I'm going to get into the um, immunity um, response of allergies in a little while. Okay, this is an article. It's called Humans Breathing with Neanderthals Created Allergies. And okay, well, okay, be- before, okay be before, you read that, before you read that, I want to just I want to add on what's going on, brother. Also, we have to understand, when I talked about the sensitivity, you know, the allergies is based off how your immune system reacts. Of abnormally of foreign things It's a sensitivity going on And that goes back to what I talk about all the time The human leukoantigens The way the organism responds to foreign things The way you respond to your, 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 response to your environment So it's abnormal The way you respond abnormally to foreign things Is what these allergies is So it's a sensitivity going on there As I stated earlier And he'll tell you where the trait comes from If he reads the article It's a tag name Go ahead, uh, Kufu Yeah, okay, it's saying uh I don't want to read this is, uh, Well I'm going to just start It says Ever wonder what or who is to blame For your peanut allergy Or your inability to walk Through a garden in spring Without sneezing You can thank the Neanderthals for that <laughs> 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 Sickly motherfucker yo. Lingering around yo Like what you say is, What you say is a cancer That forgot to die yo. <laughs> Yeah that motherfucker forgot to die yo. Get it, get it. Humans Distant and extinct cousins Uh It says uh, humans, distinct and extinct cousins, along with other another long gone species of human Denisovians, have seemingly passed on genes that has had a significant impact on Homo sapiens immune systems. Uh, the gene is believed to be responsible for the same people's sensitivity sensitivities mm-hmm. to things such as pollen, peanuts, and eggs. But on the flip side, those same genes will now help humans fight against some of the diseases related to bacteria, fungus, and parasites. Uh, so we talk about the new studies from the U.S. and European scientists uh, doing this genetic blueprint on the he- immune systems. Researchers say that humans bred with the archaic humans in Europe thousands of years ago, which resulted in a dramatic change, changes to a cluster of genes that continue to be felt today. This inheritance from Neanderthals and Denisovians the form of which became extinct 40,000 years ago, means the variation in those genes give humans the ability to react to pathogens, which are biological agents responsible for causing diseases. Mm-hmm. So there you go, brother. About the sensitivity is what allows humans to respond against some diseases, but also make humans more susceptible to allergies. So there you go, brother Shimsu. Um, that's the question. I talked about the sensitivity. We talked about what's going on. So make sure you're in the right environment. Get the right thing. And, and, and let me give you the genes. The genes are the TOL, T-O-L-L, light mm-hmm. receptor TLR genes, TLR1, TLR6, and TLR10. Some of these genes are most similar to the Neanderthal genome, and the third is most similar to the Denisovian genome group. So Shimsu, yeah. right? so you don't feel bad. You don't feel you don't feel bad about those issues, do you? That you have, do you, brother? <laughs> 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 All right. So you open up a can of worms. That's why I wasn't going to say that you don't have to know why it opens up the Ethiopian Somalian gene. But uh, <laughs> oh, actually, 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 it's my son. Um, and I was hoping okay. that one day he would grow out of those, um, out of the slight allergies that he has. That runny nose and and having to give him these. This medication, um, this pill every day, you know, to me that's 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 not not a, a you know a good look or it's un- no. You not know what, though, brother? You know what, Shinsu? It's actually you know I mean I, you know the baby the baby got it the son got it and it's good you're giving him the medication because I know you I'm, I'm sure you're seeing the medication only works for a little while. You know that's what you that, that it, it does only works for a little while, right? Right, only you gotta give it to them every day because if not, as soon as you stop giving it to so, them, that nose is running. And it comes right back. Up. Yeah, the thing, because yeah. it, it, it's not, it, medicine, medicine is not a solution at all. So the thing is that he, you know, he can take it sometimes. How old is he? 
12. And I, my concern is over a long period of time because he, you know, he's been taking some type of algae medicine for at least 10 years. Mm-hmm. Thinking about the long-term effects of what, whether it was, uh, I can't remember the um, one algae medicine he started out with, with a little bumblebee with a commercial name talked about the, uh, the side effects. Um, and now I'm not sure which one he takes now. My wife generally picks that stuff, but it's one little white pill. And I'm just thinking, yeah. he's gonna, mm-hmm. his, mother, his mother grew out of it, but I'm wondering if he will ever grow out because I feel as though that's good. I'm like, wow, what's he, going well, on? He, he only 12, so his immune system is still developing and his body is still developing. So I'm sure he's going to grow out of it slightly because he's only 12 years old. So, I mean, eventually and he I, will grow wife, out of it, but my, the thing is... Mm-hmm. And my wife, she... um. She, she breastfed for a good three months, you know, because I was definitely on her about, you know, wanting to get those, um, those, uh, that, that immune system built up through, through a breast milk. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a concern of mine. But, I mean, the boy's a genius. I mean, memory, like, like I don't know what, um, those straight-A students are high on So, you know, I mean, good shape. But just that allergy is the only defect that's Well, I want you to do to help your, your son's immune system. With this medication that you give him, start giving him um, vitamin D supplements, 1,000 IUs. Vitamin D is also as good for your immune system and the way your body responds. Um, you can also give him um, zinc is also beneficial. And make sure he takes in a good vitamin C for his immune system. So if you mix it up with the medication and give him a supplement, like a vitamin or something, a supplement to help su- um, uh, support the medication, eventually you can start to see a difference. Vitamin D is good for that type of stuff, believe it or not, and vitamin C. Zinc is zinc is his tooth. So do you give him? Do we take a multivitamin or anything? No, I, 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 my my father was one who took a lot of vitamins. I mean, a handful. Of that. I never really was a, a vitamin, but but when it's specific vitamin, you know, him and I were talking today, and I was talking about vitamin C. We got to start pumping you with a little more vitamin C, and we were talking about vitamin. Yeah. So make sure. Yeah, take make sure. Great. Be. Yeah, make yeah, make sure it's vegetable and take no swine. You make sure and make sure it's liquid. Go to the vitamin shop and ask for liquid capsules because the liquid vitamin gets in the bloodstream quicker. You know, it's just like the little, you know, you take the liquid, put the dip it, dip it, dip the cap in, and absorb it and then spread. Then put it on his tongue or in his body or whatever. And what happens is it gets in the bloodstream quicker. So if he get a good vitamin D, good vitamin C, a little zinc, and you get that to him for a few years because his body's still developing. He's only twelve. His immune system is still developing. Eventually he'll grow out of it. He might not grow out of it, grow out of it, grow out of it all the way, but he'll grow out of it slightly. Or, or he might grow out, grow out of it all the way. See, the thing is with allergies, this shit can come and go. Like, I'm sure sometimes if your wife uh-huh. is in a poor environment with death, dust, she, her allergies start to mess with her a little bit sometimes, or did it completely right. go away? She grew out of it. Yeah, because she grew out of it. And like you said, at times when she's in a real dusty area or a uh, pollinated area, she it will start affecting her first. Yeah. So yeah, it's all about boosting that boosting his immune system, man. And I promise to you, you boost that immune system, you know, he'll be good. Yeah, I would love to get him off of those medications, or, you know, off that medication. Yeah, he boost his immune system, and you know, you know, you can start going online and looking up ways to boost his immune system. Because when you start boosting, boosting his immune system, it don't become so sensitive no more because it gets the proper nutrients that it needs to keep it strong. Uh huh. Yeah, and I yep, and I wanted to say, Jake. Oh, sorry. One more, one more second, sir. You write an exact on the information that you were dropping because um, we can see in history where individuals who were deficient in certain things, they had to go either mm-hmm. up in the mountains to clear their, uh, their sinuses or whatever, breathe bronchial um, uh-huh. type of uh, uh, diseases, or they had to go into a sun, you know, sun belted area, uh, equatorial belted area. Um, in order to get vitamin D or whatever. So you absolutely right. In fact, we need to go in a tropical environment. But go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. No, brother. No, brother. I was hearing you what you were saying about your son. My daughter's 12, and she had started with having allergies at about the age of 8. And uh, the doctor, you know, her her um, physician at that time was trying was giving her flixonase or something to that effect, a little white pill. I heard you say that. But what happened was I, you know, I was reading up on that medication because I was always one that did, really didn't want to have the shots and stuff. I, you know, my mom then was fighting against me on that, but I, you know, I had a reason for it. My mom was saying 
the reason she's having these allergies is because you're not letting her take these shots and, you know, different things. But I was, you know, feeding her the things that I, I figured was good for her as I was looking it up. And so today she's 12, but she's not on those pills anymore. It's been two years. I was given, I heard uh, Brother Ngozi talking about the uh, giving them lots of fruits and juices. She was, I think it was the mangoes. She started eating a lot of mangoes and just different fruit supplements, you know. When I heard him talking about the vitamin D and stuff, you know, and I, we know we get a lot of vitamin D from the sun. Just a lot of different things he started to do, walking and exercising and things like that. And right now, she doesn't even take the, the medication. She's not, she's not, she doesn't need them. Um, now, what I do see, and I want to ask you, Brother Ngozi, was every now and again I see where I know you've heard about the eczema, the the eczema where their their skin, you know, get that little rash looking on that little rash yeah. look. And so I don't know, you know, what the main cause of that is. I've looked for so long. I, I thought it had something to do with what I was the detergent. Or I thought it had something to do with all types of different things. But then what I found out with that was that it was different, you know, different. She was using only one soap, ivory, you know, so, but yeah, just, it wasn't doing anything. That. Different types of soap. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was just using mm-hmm. ivory anyway, but it still was there. So then as that started clearing up a little bit, I noticed that um, the only thing that I really changed was her diet. That's it, you know, uh, but it, she still flares up, and, I, and so I'm still dealing with that, brother, you know. Yeah, what I was just going to say that sometimes uh, eczema can come from, it can be hereditary, and it can also come from detergent or certain types of soap. Ivy soap is a good soap because they don't have all the perfumes in it. A lot of the medication, right. they give you certain types of Aleve, Aleve lotion and different types of, um, uh, what is it, um, sur- sur- um, Sapidia, um, Sapidia, some type of uh, cream product, which is responsible for allowing it to calm it down. But it, again, it doesn't kill it. Uh-huh. it the medications uh-huh. only are designed to keep you coming. It keeps you coming. That's it's right. a drug. It keeps you That's coming. Right. It's not a healer. Keep, so the power comes the in. Mm-hmm. It keeps the customer. It makes it go away for a little while, but then you, it keeps coming. Yep. So the thing is, is that yep. you want to make sure you get, again, proper diet, proper nutrients, and rack up on shea butter, real shea butter, to allow mm-hmm. the skin, to, you know, as a good moisture for the skin. Mm-hmm. Real, not, not, I'm talking about mm-hmm. the African shea butter, the thick one. You know, right, right. You know, because all the other yeah. stuff, it, it doesn't, it doesn't give any solutions. You want to make sure she get the proper water. Um, again, uh-huh. vitamin D is also good for the way how your skin works in the immune system. All of this shit happens at the immunity. The way the immunity uh-huh. responds to things is the way you're going to see it happen on the surface or the le- uh, different levels of the skin. Um, we have epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Epidermis is the top layer of the skin. If you have depletions going on or defects going on, whatever spectrum of amino acids, it can cause an infection to occur. You know, a lot of the foods that we eat that's genetically modified and altered, the, the high sugar intake, we carry on these traits to these deficiencies genetically, and it becomes hereditary. But you can beat hered- uh, heterosity based off how you eat, proper environment, again, um, vitamin D, Top of water and good, a good moisture for the skin, which is shea butter. Clean hatch your soot on head eczema. And they found out the shit that killed her was some type of lotion that she was using. It was, it was it poisoned her. You can look into that. It's an article on that. Yeah. Oh, you know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and, with, and with that, we're going to end the show on that note. I thank all the listeners, all the callers for calling in. You were listening to Team Osiris Radio, and you are now on the horizon. Uh, you can check us out at com. Check us out, Team Osiris, on Facebook. Uh, Amir Kamara, you want to let people know where they can reach you? Uh, Amir Kamara on Facebook, A A M I R C A M A R A, and um, Team Osiris. And you can also catch me on the show on Amal Squad, where we have Team Osiris website, and we have Team Osiris Facebook page, and uh, Team Osiris group. So you can reach me there. But if you want to reach me directly, Amir Kamara, A M I R. C A M A R A. So with that, I want to say peace, blessings on blessings to all the callers. Excellent show, brother.
Geico presents sharing versus oversharing. Yesterday, Cliff Sora shared a top 10 list of hot fusion restaurants, a vegan gluten-free mashup recipe, and a podcast featuring organic food trends. Oh, TMI, I, too much internet information. That's oversharing. Cliff, Geico has something worth sharing with your friends. Like how on geico.com you could save hundreds on your car insurance, update your policy, and report a claim. Gluten-free info that's easy to swallow. Mm. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Geico presents sharing versus oversharing. Today, Bridget Griffin shared a video of her daily yoga routine, two self-help articles, and her new blog called Build Your Inner Bridge with Bridge. Girl, your sharing has turned into oversharing. No worries, Bridge. Geico has some info worth sharing with your seven blog followers, like how you could save money on your car insurance, update your policy, and report a claim just by visiting geico.com. How's that for building your inner bridge? Bridge, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Blog Talk Radio. Knock, knock from that hot spot. I don't know why I'm rhyming. I'm in all black. When the light's out, you can still see that I'm shining. I can't believe y'all made me come here. Since I'm here, listen clear, just more smoke to the open air, prepare to fire, it's so clear, pay homage. I said pay homage. This is ruthless, like a family of five and they ruthless. I'm on my, my mind, I flew the coop quick like a G5 with no stewardess. Forgive me God, but this music makes me feel like a god, that's the truth. Sh- I just laughed at the fact that stupid, like being cross-eyed and toothless. Better dot your eyes and cross your teeth if you talk to me. But I don't talk that much, so just step aside The rap game's been bugged, I'm pesticide You better use this, if you catch a high, you misused it I'm not new to this, but it's my time New rules, new rules Been on my grind, take care of mine New crew What you know about me, I'm the next best thing Brain food, brain food, brain food. And if you ever around me, I don't sugarcoat nothing I do Pay homage Peace. This is Kufu Mahakaru with Team Osiris Radio. We're going to take a brief intermission and play some music while we get this show shut up. So just bear witness for a second. Tonight's show will be dealing with the origins of the white race with Brother Gaius and Gozi. And we will be going into the um, the evolution of the European race, uh, the different phenotypes, the different bone structures, where they came from, uh, their rise to the top of the uh, the human the, the the rise to the top of the world, you know. And um, just gonna have some historical facts as well. So. Just bear with me. I'm going to play a song real quick. And also, while we get the um, show loaded up, check us out, www.timosirisradio on the blog or www.timosiris.com for our website page, Timosiris on Facebook. Uh, and Gozi DNA. Uh, check out brother some of our other brothers, brother Konsu, uh, Kalem. We we'll talk with the Titans, brother Melvin, brother Cameron, Gitchi Gullah Jack. Um, everybody has some good information, so please uh, check those brothers out on the uh, on the web as well. So um, I got the studio loaded up. I'm going to go to a song real quick. And um, I see we have a lot of callers calling in already waiting. I appreciate you calling in. I appreciate you bear witness. I appreciate you bear uh, bearing with us. We have some uh, internet issues. But I'm going to just play one song real quick. Then we're going to get right into the show. Um, if you have your press one on your keypad, we'll bring you in and uh, bring you into the conversation at any time during the call. So get into a track real quick. Okay. 
Let's see what I got. Call me Rosie Gold. I got holy friends. Holy ho. I'm in holy hands. Rosie Gold, I got holy friends. Holy ho. I'm in holy hands. Rosie Gold, I got holy friends. Holy ho. I'm in holy hands. I I'm like fucking. I know you, and I know you're hearing a better version over there than I'm hearing from the phone, so I'm like, damn. I don't know if people start talking this. You're going to start acting like I ain't initiated to this shit, man. <laughs> you know how you go. Like, I, I did this shit. I put this shit together. I spit this shit. Nigga, I made this shit. <laughs> you're like, fuck that. It's my shit. Nigga, you couldn't do it. I did it. <laughs> Call me Rose and go. I got holy friends, holy ho, I'm in holy hands. I got holy friends, holy ho, I'm in holy hands. You are not on earth. Holy friends, that means I am too proper. proper. I got holy hands, niggas too choppers. And I print money, I get grants to shoppers. I reserve fed notes, give girls bed strokes. I'm a higher fire, I desire red smoke. And it's burning, baby. You learning, baby. You are not on earth. You want that hate. I got holy friends. I'm in holy hands. Rosie Gold, I got holy friends. Holy ho, I'm in holy hands. I got holy This is Kofu, and I'm back. We just had to take a small break, small intermission. Uh, this is Timo Size Radio. Uh, got the foremost runner of the Westerner, the Wasir, the Saw himself, Brother Ngozi. Peace, what's good? Peace to you, Brother Timo Size. Let's get it. What's the word, yo? Uh, you know what it is. Uh, today's show, we're supposed to be breaking down the uh, the origins of the white race. Where do they come from? Mm-hmm. How do they become white? Where, what is their lineage? Um, out of Africa, which way did they go? Where did they get stuck at? How do they develop their technology, their diet? How they interact interacted with their environment? Uh, how they was able to come out of a, a situation being trapped up in Europe or in the Caucasus Mountains to, you know, to appear to be ruling the world to this day and how they even got there. So what we want to start out is, um, I guess we could start out basically giving a brief overview of the um, out of Africa theory. Where did these people actually come from? Because a lot of people, they think that, you know, they came from black people or they came from Africans, indigenous Africans. And, you know, we went through an article before that was over, um, <clears throat> that said that the Nubians went into the Levant. 70,000 years. Yeah, 100 some thousand years ago. Was years. Yeah, it was, I think it was 160. And then they had another one that they went up there. I think he was saying 70. But right, that's when a, they started breathing with a, the Neanderthal. Yeah, that was a, it was, um, let, let, let's go a little bit before our species, because you had a few out of Africa, um, um, Af- out of Africa um, migrations that wasn't successful. So we had one with our species that happened around 160,000 years ago, but that really wasn't successful. And we know this because we're finding fossils, or anthropologists are finding fossils of modern humans um, in China and certain parts of Israel, like the Skahul Cave in Israel, around 100,000 to 120,000 to 90,000 years. Those migrations wasn't successful. Now, the one that was successful was the out of Africa um, successful um, migration, which occurred 70 to 60,000 years ago. And I talk about the phylogenetic tree or a specific SNP or haplogroup that shows and proved this and show a, a variant, something called the Yap marker, which shows this autonatistic features that modern Caucasians have. So the skull structures was already kind of changed, the aqualine features. You start to see that development in East Africa, then you start to see it with the Vidoite race in earlier Saudi Arabia, like the um, the Mahari groups of Saudi Arabia, the Mahari. They had dark-skinned people, but they have narrow features. The Javidians like the Arulas. 
And then you start to find it with the people in early Iraq and Iran. These were brown-skinned and dark-skinned people that lived in their certain zones. So you saw it. So the earliest Caucasian 24,000 years ago looked more like Alicia Keys or Obama. I'm talking about as far as the skin tone. It was brown, light brown. Even when you mix it up with Neanderthal, who also had fair skin, if you mix it up with like they did in Israel around 50,000 years ago when modern humans bred with Neanderthal, who had fair skin, you still don't get pale skin. You still get the lightest brown color. So that's so it's impossible for them to have. This is a whole other mutation. This SLC245 mutation happened around 6,000 to 10,000 years ago when you start to see a completely fair-skinned people that's, that's, that's so unique that it looks damn near close to albinism, but it's not. And it's a lot of things that goes on in between the SLC245, also the mutation of the OCA2, which affects the HARC2 level, or OCA2, Ocleocutaneous strand 2, which is the second strand of albinism. So we have to understand what's going on with these different um, genetic variants that happen. So these people come out of Central Asia, and the paternal lineage that they had was haplogroup R1B, which is an offshoot of haplogroup P. I mean, before R1B, you had R1, R1, uh, R1A and R1B, then you have R1, and then you go all the way back to haplogroup P that develops in Kazakhstan, near, again, Central Asia. Um, okay, so when you pause right there, mm-hmm. then Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Timo Cyrus is on the horizon. We're going to bring a call in. Caller from the 863, you are now in tune with Timo Cyrus. Peace. Peace. Peace to the kings on the line. It's brother, brother Patah. What's going on, Ngozi? Peace, Patah. What's, cool? what's going on, bro? What's going on? Chilling, man. Chilling, man. Hey, I have a question. Can you mm-hmm. um, break down the uh, the rhesus factor in humans and also touch on uh, the sulfur content in the uh, cell structure of humans? Yeah, we, we, we're going to get into that um Right after we deal with this Kazakhstan thing, we'll, we'll definitely pick up on that. Yeah, because it's not, the research factor in humans is not what, I'm just going to say this to your touch-up, it's not what people think. Most people are RH positive. It's only, it's, it's only a few people on the planet that's RH negative, and that's a problem. RH negative is, 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 is not rare as RH positive. So we can get into blood types and different things later. So we'll find out what's going on with this certain D antigen that most humans have compared to the people that don't have that D antigen, which is RH negative, which is really rare. That's the thing, because most of them, I, mean, I hear racists or people that deal with pseudoscience or try to say, oh, white people are mostly RH negative. That's not true. I mean, that's not true at all. When you deal with the first case of uh, maritoblastosis, it was a French midwife. But, you know, that's not common amongst uh, the RH negative is, is when women have RH negative. And that's the problem when they breed with a person that is RH positive. And what happens is, is that her blood attacks that baby, and it kills it, and it becomes a chemical reaction called erythroblastosis. And what doctors do now, because it's so rare, they give them a de-antigen shot. So now we got to understand how antigens work in blood. <laughs> so that's, 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 I'm, that's my answer to that question right there. I'm, uh, I'm blood type B positive, but I'm also RH positive. You have Africans on the continent that's RH positive. It has nothing to do with us mixing backwards and forward and all that other bullshit they saying. That's bullshit. Just like you have monkeys, baboons, with, with blood type O negative. Look it up. All that shit talking about O negative means original, that's bullshit. You have a chimpanzee, I mean, no, not chimpanzees, but but um, baboons with blood type O negative. Look into that right now if you get a chance, brother. So I'm just going to give you a glimpse of that, about how those antigens work. Yeah. Okay, and then to go back to what um, um, Kufu had first talked about, um, about the haplogroup coming out of uh, the continent or in the Middle East, um, would uh, mm-hmm. Homo ergaster or Homo um, uh, uh, erectus erectus be uh, mm-hmm. be the first ones to to have those haplogroups? No, no, no. They they haplogroups. But see, the, the phylogenetic tree that we're dealing with now from from this age from the not a zero zero. But the beginning of A0 and A0, this is modern humans. And these genes oh, go back 200,000. Okay. A0 goes back 338,000. So 338,000, that that's not even a modern human. So all of the, this, this is what kills the whole thing that the white man is a Neanderthal. There is no haplogroup that none of us have on this planet that comes from a Neanderthal. All our haplogroups are from modern humans. And from the paternal side, it's an offshoot of a haplogroup CT. And for the mitochondrial DNA side, 
for the people outside of Africa. It's an offshoot of Haplo Group L3. Um, people outside of Africa has the less genetic variations than we do. They have over 150 genetic variants compared to Africa is more diverse. You have 250. So you have more diversity on the continent of Africa compared to, compared to outside, meaning less, meaning that it, 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 uh, these people that live out of the continent, there wasn't even that many people. They didn't even take that many unique traits with them. Most diversity starts in the continent before even leaving out. And that's that's right. So how we also, became. Yeah. I was just going to yeah, say how we also became also. Homo sapiens sapiens because of the mm-hmm. genetic diversity of our predecessors. Correct. Outside of Africa, there's so, only 150. Within Africa, 200. And that's dealing with all those Homo DNA in the chain. Go ahead, brother. I was just going to ask. Well, the L3 is in Africa. L L2 and L3 is in Africa. Right. Yeah, L3, L2, L1 is in Africa. I'm L3, F1, B1. My ancestors migrate from East Africa and go through the Sahil Belt. And when they go through the Sahil Belt, a lot of them are responsible for speaking the um, Chadic languages, which is the Afro-Asiatic language, which is Hausa, which is Afro-Asiatic. They have mitochondrial DNA L3, F1, B2. Mine is L3, F1, B1. It stays within the Sahil, and a lot of them become pastoralist Fulani women. And a few of them kind of sprinkle into northern Nigeria, and become the northern Yoruba groups compared to the ones in the southern Yoruba groups. And a few of them go all the way down to Senegal and, my, and uh, different parts of Mauritania. So L3F1B1 is an offshoot of L3. But she went west. Compared to the other L3s, they leave out and become M and N. And from M and N, they become U1, U2, U3, U4, U5, U6. That's the offshoots of N. The ones that are the offshoots of M become M, M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, M6. And then the one that also kept going all the way down to those U's, they go back and through the, like certain parts of uh, Mongolia and become mighty conjure DNA B and A. And a lot of those are the ones that was responsible for coming through the Bering Strait and making it to the Americas as they crossed the Siberian mountains. And the other ones who left out, like mighty conjure DNA M2, she also made it to the Americas and Haplogroup Group um, 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 M130. Which is the same haplogroup, which is the first offshoot of haplogroup CT and 168 and 130 is what Aboriginal Australians have. You find those gene variants in people in South America. We show that somewhere down the line, you have two types of people living in America a black population of Aborigine groups and a lighter brown population who cross the Siberian and the, um, the Siberian Australia and the Mongolian Australia becoming an Inuit in Alaska with haplogroup P and Q and other little branches. All right, that's what's up, man. P, uh, Brother Fatah, man, we're going to leave your line open. We're going to get back to this Kazakhstan thing, and so we're going to get, you know, try to bring it all the way up to, you know, this modern cool. European. If you're dealing with the origins. My line. Uh, appreciate you calling in, man. We're going to keep your line open. Yeah, that's my brother, Simpson. He keeps he keep oh, yeah, like the he keep, he keep the, he keep the good lights and synapse moving. He asks the questions that gut people. I, lo- I love it. That's my brother. Yeah, I met, I met the brother. He's a good brother. He's got a beautiful family. Yes, sir. So, yeah, you want to um, start back with the, the Kazakhstan? So, yeah, in Kazakhstan, which is, you know, Central Asia, you know, you have Turkey, you have Kazakhstan, all these areas. All this is Central Asia. And it's right here, you know, where you start to find, you know, the common father of haplogroup R, from R, and R1, and R1, you have R, uh, R1B and R1A that split and go different directions. It's these populations of people, and you can find this in Human Journey, written by Spencer Way, for the, epi- the epigenetics, when environment can turn genes off and on, when it's hard to allow cells to read genes because environmental pressures is causing genes off and on to cause um, switches and we see the phenotype looking different externally. So I'm going to go into prior out of African migrations to talk about his proto ancestors or archaic groups of humans that left out of the continent before our species did that didn't succeed. Homo erectus left out of Africa, which is the offshoot of Homo agastar, and he leaves out of Africa or arose in Africa around 2 million years ago. A little bit afterwards, you have 1.8 million years ago when a lot of them start to leave out. You start to find Homo erectus, which is Homo genius, which is part of the Homo the human family. Homo means same genius is the species that we are. Homo genius. Our branch of the genius is sapien sapien. Their branch of the genius genius was erectus. Homo erectus. Anyway, when these species leave out of Africa, they leave out around one eight million years ago. We know this because when you go in the Georgia area near the Caucasus, you look at Homo demonansi, and you can see that these um, creatures was around one point seventy five million years ago. 
which is not older. Now, we have to understand point percentages. 1.75 is not older than a whole 1.8 or 1.9 or 2 million. 1.75 is on the border, 8, 9, 10, or 8, 9, 3, three numbers off from that whole 2.0. So we also have to understand that 2.0 or 2 million years ago is when the earliest Homo erectus formed in Africa, which is Homo ergastar. So these species leave out of Africa. You find these fossils in, um, in wolf caves where they was dragged to. You find them in China. You find them all over. You know, that's one successful one. Homo erectus was all through, you know, certain parts of Europe, certain parts of Asia, all types of places. So this is 1.8 million years ago. Then you have another migration that occurred with another offshoot of our early archaic human ancestors. The genius is um, Hedabagensis. Hedabagensis was responsible for giving rise to our species and Neanderthal. He breaks out of the continent around 600,000 years ago. 600,000 years ago, Homo Hedabagensis leaves out of Africa, and he starts to go in a different directions. In some parts, he becomes um, um, Homo Neanderthalus, which we know uh, about the Neanderthal. Then he becomes Denisovan. Did the Siberian areas, and in some areas he even goes into become um, other um, groups like the Red Deer Cave people. But the Red Deer Cave people were more closer to that they just found in China in that cave thirteen, uh, that was thirteen thousand years old. They were more closer to our, our early archaic specimen of Homo sapiens sapiens, archaic Homo sapiens sapiens, because you have Homo sapiens sapiens, and then you have the uh, earlier group which is archaic groups, and they survive long enough, and then you find these fossils in the Red Deer Cave in China, but. But they did, but these creatures evolved in Africa. They did, they did, they wasn't a direct offshoot of Homo or Hela began outside of Africa. So that's another um, successful one that that happened. But they didn't get a chance to breed with people. But anyway, Homo or Hela began as leads out 600,000 years ago and becomes different variants of, um, of different types of hominids from Homo dinosaurus to Homo neanderthalus. Now Homo neanderthalus, we know that he was outside of his lead uh, because the environmental pressures that he developed in caused him to have rickets. His rear cage is much wider. Um, the creatine level of the carinocytes uh, Carino Carino levels was much more higher because he adapted in colder climate, so his skin was brute and tougher to adjust with cold climate. Um, his vocal box, it shows that his vocal box, from the way he sound, he had a high-pitched voice. The back of his neck was much more wider, and, he, and, he was, um, and, his, and, his, and his shoulders was more broad. So he developed poorly in a poor environment. I mean, if you have rickets, this is some type of vitamin D deficiency. Which shows that this creature didn't develop, and um, and he wasn't from there originally. He developed in that area in a poor environment, so he had a lot of ailments that came with it. And when you look up now, and they finding out, anthropologists is finding out that, you know, from the salt tissues that they can measure of Neanderthal, he had a lot of deformities, a lot of deformities, addictions, um, diabetes, all types of weird stuff they finding out about this creature because he developed in a poor environment compared to Homo dinosaurin who lived in. A little at this time, Siberia was a little bit more warmer, and he also traveled all the way through um, Malay, uh, Melanesia, where a lot of the black people that you find on the Solomon Islands have Denisovan traits, they're Homo Denisovan traits. So these are archaic human groups that left out of Africa, right? Now we get to the point of a specific group of people. Let's go to the phylogenetic tree. Now, okay, Koi let's, said, pause, let's, let's, let's pause with the um, archaic. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna to try to get people in, uh, you know, involved with the conversation. Um, we're gonna bring callers in as they put their hands up, but you gotta stay relative to the subject because we're gonna to try to have a flow and a narrative here. Um, this is Timo Size Radio. Check us out www.timosize.com. Timo Size on uh, Facebook. I made Kamara and Gozi DNA Facebook. Caller from the two six seven piece. You're on with Timo Cyrus. Okay. Got the hand raised? Yeah, call up from the 267. Hello? Uh, okay, let's just keep it moving. We was with the archaic humans. He was about to go into the, uh, now, the genetic. Now, yeah, now, you know, our species or the or humans. Which was the first offshoot of Australopithecus afarensis, which those wasn't humans. Autopithecus wasn't humans. Or Sahir Autopithecus wasn't a human. None of those or none of those different um Australopithecus things was, was, was human. These were the predecessors of humans. Our earliest branch of humans comes from Handyman. The first human developed around two point five million years ago and his name is Homo habilis. Homo habilis two point five million years ago gave rise to Homo ergastar, which became Homo erectus. 
None of those, none of the, he didn't leave out. You know, that's the one that they found out that Homo Nilati was possibly breeding with, um, uh, his ancestor was a crossbreed between Australopithecus and Homo habilis. This is why his feet looked the way it looked in his, in, 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 the, in his hands. So that's a different story. So Homo habilis didn't leave out. It was Homo erectus that left out. You know, and after him, Homo heterobiganus left out. And also Homo anecessor, which is another offshoot of Homo ergaster or Homo erectus that also left out. And they found these fossils in Germany. So these... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, that's cool. 267, I, your, your line is open. You can raise your hand again. What's good? Team Osiris. What's good? Team Osiris, back at the fire. My fault. I had my uh, my phone on mute. What's good with y'all? I'm just saying, thank um, y'all. Letting y'all just, just listen. Hey, y'all just gonna say. It's Bunchy Carter. What's good? Oh, peace, brother. What's going on? Peace. What's good, and good? What's good, Kufu? Peace, man. Yeah, what's, what's good, good man? Yeah, I got, I got a few things going on, so I'm going to just mute my mic. I'm going to chime in a little bit. Okay, cool. Uh, so what, 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 okay, what? go ahead. You were talking about uh, Homo Nilati, and then you were talking about Homo an- Anacestor. Yeah, Homo Anacestor. He left so out Homo, of So Homo Nilati, so basically they was going back and forth. They was already breeding. Yeah, they, was already, they were already breeding. Before even anatomic you, humans come on this scene. Yeah, even before anatomic um, humans came or modern humans came, they were already breeding. Even modern human is just not a result of natural selection. We are also a result of sexual selection. There was a lot of crossbreeding that happened in order for us to become what we are in between. So it wasn't just natural selection that occurred. It was also, you know, a sexual selection. We found this out when you discovered the haplogroup A00. Haplogroup A00 predates modern human fossils. So the oldest fossils that they found of a modern human of our species goes back 200,000 years in Ethiopia, in Omo Valley. But, and it was a female. But then you turned around and found Omo Man 1 and Omo Man 2. Now, Omo Man 1 and Omo Man 2, they were Homo sapien adult 2, which is a little archaic branch of a Homo sapien sapien. They really wasn't Homo sapien sapien. The oldest branch of our species was Homo sapien sapien, which was the fossils they found was a woman. Now, with scientists like um, 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 Michael Hammer and, and other groups of um, either geneticists and um, a few anthropologists, what they're discovering is, is that it's a possibility that females evolved into modern humans first, not humans. I'm talking about anatomically correct humans that we are now, or modern humans, because what they're finding out is that the oldest fossils, which exist a little bit prior before Omo Man 1 and Omo Man 2, the oldest fossils of a modern human was a female. It was a, it's not um, Lucy. Lucy that people talk about, who's, who people call Degnesh, and I hear people talking about the oldest one who was 3 million years old. That wasn't a female woman. That was an Australopithecus afterensis. Degnesh is nobody but Lucy. Do the history and also the documentary of this individual um, when they found him in Kazakhstan. And it's through these people who look similar to, uh, they look similar to mongoloids, but they're not. They look similar to them. They're not really mongoloids. That's how they found out now that even in um, uh, early America, a lot of the early Americans had so-called European genes. They wasn't. They didn't look like modern Europeans today. The genes mutate first before phenotype. They just carried those traits over. And you also found a Clovic um, culture and different shit that's real similar that was going on, and you know, and a few peoples in the early Americas and in, in the early Europe. So you find it over here, and people might say, "Well, isn't Goldie saying that Europeans was first?" No, I'm not saying that. They didn't even look like that. You just had dream, genes that was already migrating going through Siberia as well, as well with those traits coming over here, you know. And the mongoloid is nothing but a, a cousin to, and, and there's no such thing as a mongoloid race. This is a phenotype that people develop, you know. There's no such thing as a negroid race or a caucasoid race. This, if you deal with epigenetics, phenotype is exterior, and it's based off, you know, genes going off and on because different environmental pressures will cause things to look a certain way. So we got to get out of that idea that, you know, uh, I'm saying that mongoloids was here first or, you know, a certain population was here first. Genes can go off and on, especially when you deal with polytopicity. Polytopicity can make things look, go backwards and forward. You can put two different types of organisms in a similar environment, and they can look the same because of the levels of temperature, but when you go and dissect it, it's not the same. And that's the trick of polytopicity or throwback polymorphism. Poly means multiple morphism is a change that goes on in between. So you find this shit going on, man, you know, um, early humans that, that, you know, that migrate through here. So anyway, back to this um, Kazakhstan, Central Asia, it's these people that give rise to uh, early proto-Caucasians. 
before migrating even to the Caucasus Mountains. A good book to read on this subject, and I'm giving my reference, is a book by Nell Painter called The History of White People. Look this book up, Nell Painter, History of White People. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think the sister is a geneticist or anthropologist, but she's legit and she's real. You can see her teaching also on a type of name up, Nell Painter, History of White People. She's breaking shit down, yo. Type up. So it's okay. this population, it's this population that uh, migrates and become the proto or first. Proto means first or before uh, Caucasian. This is even before the Indo-European languages that arose in Turkey around 3,000 or 4,000 years ago. These people were the ones that populated and went to different directions of Central Asia, and later on became Caucasian from that area going through. Because you deal with the Caucasus Mountains, you have the minor Caucasus and the minor, and the major Caucasus. The minor Caucasus, they call it the horseshoe. And you have the Black Sea, which is the minor Caucasus. You have near the Black Sea below, which is right above Turkey. And above that, you start seeing the major Caucasus near the Ural Mountains. That's near Russia and Mongolia and all that shit. So this is the direction that they went before even migrating into the Caucasus area. So these early Caucasians before going into the Caucasus Mountains came out of Central Asia. Look up Kostikimon, haplogroup CV20, Kostikimon that they found in Russia. I think the man Go ahead brother You said the name of the book was called The History of White People History of White People Nail Painter Yeah okay Okay I, I checked it out it's, uh, it's on Amazon Yes sir N-E-L-L Last name Painter P A. I That's right. Are. That's right. So yeah, this is a good book which explains you know different things that went on and um, different things that occurred. Also, Spencer Wells' book Human Journey. If you want to understand understand the route that we went through, to become what we are as, as, as Homo sapiens sapiens. So anyway, um, before we even made it to Central Asia and before we made it to Kazakhstan, human beings was already breeding with Neanderthals. We started breeding with Neanderthals. But you got to understand. Um, at the end of the Pleistocene, Pleistocene ranges in between um, 2,588,000 years ago and it ends 11,700 years ago. But even before that, around in the Mendel Glacier period, which which occurred, the early caps of the Mendel Glacier period, a lot of the Neanderthals found their way out of uh, the northern caps and they go into, they make it as early as far as all the way down to Israel. Israel. So around 50,000 years ago, you know, modern humans is meeting up with these motherfuckers over here. Now, we know that the first hybrids between Neanderthals and modern humans, um, due to Neanderthal gene variance, was 99.7.5% similar. It was off by 0.12%. It, it ranges between 99.5% to 99.7.5%. So, due to those little unique changes at the Demi level, that's large. So, even though we're different subspecies of Homo genius, he's Homo Neanderthalus and we're Homo sapiens sapiens, at the same time, he's still human. You can mix and breed with, with, with certain species within our genus between 1.8 million years. If you go back to uh, 1.8 million years, you can find these things. We can, you can adapt and you can breed. It doesn't mean that the offsprings will be successful. They might live three days. They might live up to five years. They might live up to ten years. It's not going to be successful. So between now and 1.8 million years within a homogeneous branch, you can do it. It's impossible for you to breed with Homo habilis because it's a little bit too far off. His gene connections, connections was more close to Australopithecus afarensis. But anyway, Neanderthal, which was a subspecies of our branch of humans, but he still was human because you have different subspecies of humans back then. Today, we don't have different subspecies. We're all the same species. So you can get that out of your head. But back then, we had different subspecies of the human family. Um... He was able to breed with them. But the first offspring that were males were sterile. The same thing when you have a liger. Now, in my video, I said something out of context. We was in a going with the flow. I said a donkey. A donkey's not sterile. It's a mule. That's what I meant to say. That's when I was outside of New York. But anyway, what I'm saying about here is, is that ligers, male ligers are sterile. Female ligers are not sterile. She can breed with a male lion or a male tiger to give off offspring. But a male liger, that shit's dead. So the first hybrids between Homo sapiens, sapiens, and Neanderthals, those first males were sterile. It wasn't successful. So they bred with their offshoots, which was the daughter hybrids. Now, okay, pause well, right there. Okay, we're going to pause. Timo Cyrus is on the horizon. Um, listen to Timo Cyrus Radio. Brother Kansu, peace. Peace, peace, family. What's going on, man? Peace, brother Ngozi. 
Peace, um, Peace brother. Peace, 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 but yeah, okay, but, it goes. Where where was this? Where was they? Where were they breeding at? The um, when they were, you know, the modern humans and the um, Neanderthals. And they started doing it in the Middle East, in the so-called Middle East, in in, in this Israel area. That's when they started doing it. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> so Abraham was a was a Neanderthal. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure. If I'm sure, Alan no, Parker. I'm just, I'm just being funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, they they start doing it in Israel, the Middle East, even before they made it to Kazakhstan. See, we don't find a half of a group of humans that ma- a sex chromosome in humans that matches up with Neanderthal. You find it in the autosomal DNA, and you find it in our human leukoantigens, the way our immune system responds to certain things and certain traits that we have, or the high level of carinocytes or carotene in Caucasian skin, which allow them to adjust to cold climate and shit. This is where you find this shit at. You don't find it in a, in a sex chromosome in any of our phylogenetic tree from haplogroup A, meaning the beginning, all the way down to the last haplogroup R1B for uh, in a phylogenetic tree, or from the mitochondrial DNA L0 all the way down to mitochondrial DNA, you know, uh, C through B, which is the last on the mitochondrial side. So you don't find all these are modern human haplogroups or sex chromosomes. You find this shit going on early down the line, and it happened. And a lot of us kept, you know, it wasn't that many of them. So even though we were breeding with them, the offshoot males wasn't successful. The daughters were successful. And those offshoot hybrid daughters kept breeding with more modern humans, reducing the Neanderthal gene from 50% to 25, breeding with more modern humans from 25 to 15 to 12 and 13 and a half, and more modern humans reducing it all the way down to what we see today, which is 3 to 4%. And that's not enough to be a separate species because Neanderthal was already similar to Montreal Degnes. The Ethiopians that discovered her called the Degnes, and the scientists that put it out there on the scene called the Lucy. And it was a reason why. You guys can look into the history of Acelopithecus afarensis. But with modern humans, they found the modern human fossils belong to a female, and she was 200,000 years old. Now we know about Omo Man 1 and Omo Man 2 in southern Ethiopia, but even those groups were a little bit archaic, and these were men. But she was a 200,000-year-old fossil. But what's going on? Why did this happen? First of all, most humans back then were hunter-gatherers. So with them being hunter-gatherers, men was always going out to hunt. Compared to women who sat down, they had more time to think, organize things, keep things in a certain structure, and also they had more time to function. Even when you deal with genes, female genes develop a little bit more quicker or they become more, become more um, adulterate quicker than men. So it's a possibility that females evolve into modern humans before man. Because when you discover haplogroup A00, which they found in the African-American man, um, Michael Hammer, he discovered in the African-American man, and they were trying to find out why is it that this gene or this haplogroup goes back 338,000 years, but modern human fossils only go back 200,000 years. What the hell is going on? So what he did was he went back. Into uh, he was tested DNA and he went back to the slave coast that a lot of our ancestors were taken from, from southwestern Central Africa, you know, Ivory Coast, Gold Coast, you know, in Central Africa near you know um, Congo or whatever. So when he go into the rainforest, he discovered the same haplogroup amongst the Mbuti people, a small pygmy people, and he found it amongst eleven of them. And and when and when he went back, he's like, okay, now they're trying to say that these people were breeding with. Archaic humans that was already in the rainforest. So you have these people from East Africa who were probably already modern humans, but when they go into West Africa or the, the different parts of West Africa, they start breeding with these archaic group, possibly Homo rhodogenesis, which is another one that exists. One of the first offshoots from Homo heterogenesis that became Homo rhodogenesis or Homo, Homo rhodoforensis, which gave rise to Homo sapien or Homo sapien adults who that became Homo sapien sapien later. A lot of the remnants of him were still floating around. So we have haplogroup A00. And from A00, from the phylogenetic tree, the SNP mutates into A0, then A1b, and then A1bt. And from A1bt, you find these four subclade branches of A. From A00, you get to A0, and then A1, and then A1bt, and then ABT. You find these ABTs and the A0, not A00, amongst modern humans like the Khoisan. 
that live in South Africa, or the Nur of Sudan, or the Mercy, or the Summer. These groups, or the Dinka, a few of them have this, um, the after effect of A00, which became that. So it's a possibility that A00 was breeding with L0, and L0 was a little bit before Genetic Eve that we know. Genetic Eve that left out of Africa was mitochondrial DNA L3, not L1. Not L2, it was L3. And when you follow the mtDNA, you find L3 becomes M and N outside of Africa or on her way out the door of Africa. She becomes M. A few of them stay back and go into L3, L4, L5, L6, which stays on the eastern coast of Ethiopia. Then she becomes M on her way out the door. Then she goes near into the Middle East and becomes M, M1, where she carries M1 and M becomes M1, M2, M4. You find it all through India. A few of those women come back in. This is why in East Africa or Northeast Africa, you find mighty conjure DNA M in there. You also find U6 in North Africa. So in the back migrations of the continent, you find more foreign women who come back in, bringing their mutations with them. This is why in North Africa, you find mighty conjure DNA H up there. That's the Sami um, haplogroup that comes from Southern Europe, but it developed somewhere in the Near East, near the Caucasus areas in the Near East and Central Asia. It comes back in. You find mighty conjure DNA U6 coming back in. That's been in North Africa for almost 20,000 years. Then you find it's M1. M1 is what a lot of Ethiopian and Somali women have. Then you find the L4s, L5s, L6s. So you find them coming back in. The phyl- in the phylogenetic tree, when you look at the mitochondrial DNA, there's more variance in the MT side than there's on the uh, paternal side or the Y chromosome side when you start looking into it. So right now we're just dealing with the genes. So it's a possibility that the ones who evolved in the modern and time to correct humans first were females because she was breeding with these different archaic groups. And these different archaic groups breeding in between gave rise to the complexity of the Homo sapiens sapiens, which started through our mother. And then she kept breeding with a little bit more archaic groups. She gave birth to, you know, sons eventually like we have now. And the sons go from A00 to A0 and from A0 to A1B and from A1B to ABT and then from BT. We go all the way down to half the group CT, which develops in East Africa. And it was through him, which is yet positive, who gave rise to my haplogroup E, the Egyptians' haplogroup E, the Ethiopians' haplogroup E, your haplogroup E, African Americans' haplogroup E, and he also gave rise to the D marker that a lot of people in Japan have, and the CF and the CV20 of the fraternal man that they found in, in Russia, and these other groups of people, all the way down through IJK that splits off and become IJ. One group of the IJ is going to Europe, the Cro-Magnum people, and branch off and become the single I. Another group stay behind and become the haplogroup JP209 in the Arabian Peninsula, and from JP209, J1, and J2. This is what happened. But the C, but the E marker, which is um, EM96, which develops in, in, in Africa, stayed behind. He never left out. And then from there, he gave rise to that different um, um, subclass branches of E, all the way down from, you know, half the group, you know, um, M- M- M96, all the way down to um, the EP2, and then you find from EP2, you develop the E1B1As and the E1B1Bs that stay behind compared to the people that left out. You find these D markers outside, and a lot of the dark skinned people of the Adam and Islands have D markers, which develop in Asia. Even though they're still dark skinned, it develops in Asia. And if some person asks the question, why are these people still dark skinned? It's, it's, it's a reason why. If you understand equatorial zones, zone one, and understand a different the type of ultraviolet rays that they get, it makes sense that people that left out of Africa was able to maintain their dark skin. Now, if we understand epigenetics. Epigenetics just shows how environmental pressures can cause um, genes to switch off and on. But we also understand that in genetics or mutations, mutation starts um, inside first before outside. So it's inside before you start to see it happen on the phenol side. So a lot of the people that you find outside of Africa, like the dark-skinned people in India and the black people in the Adam and Islands, the Onji people, they were able to maintain their dark skin because they live in zone one, and the zone one allows them to maintain their levels of tyrosine, which is responsible for the hormone melanosomes, with that hormone melanosomes, which gives us the melanocytes, which gives us a higher levels of darker pigment. So they were able to keep that, but due to them eating different foods, certain types of turtle meat that are left out of Africa, that, and different types of plants and crops that's not in Africa, it allowed the gene variants to change. So they don't have the same haplogroup group that people did that stayed within Africa. They'd have their own unique markers that mutated within the continent of Asia. So this is the first out of Africa descendants. You feel me? These are the first Correct. out of Africa descendants. Go ahead. Correct. That's good. So everybody want to know what's the origins, you know, in the Afrocentric circle, they might say the beast, the mm-hmm. devil, 
you know, but in the scientific team on science group, you know, we just deal with the degenerate human. The degenerate human uh, race. Uh-huh. Yeah, degenerate human. Um, mm-hmm. Which one of those lineages went into Asia, got stuck in Asia, developed more mutations, then carried the SLC four five eight two into Europe? Well, we have to understand what happened. The SLC two four eight five, which is salute carrier family twenty four sodium potassium calcium exchanger number five which goes on in the NCXT con- uh, contents inside of uh, a depletion or um, a shift in 111 amino acids, acid, which which is responsible for allowing them to develop this uh, so-called uh, pale skin or this pinkish skin, which is still a form of melanin, but it's low. We can't really, I mean, some people like, I can be, you know, philosophical and equate it to uh, melanin, but melanin is really what we have on our nipples, our genitalia areas, and the pink part of our lips. So I just say that as a joke, but I also say it as a, as a slick remark that refers to something called spurs. So it's a low level of your melanin, which is not in high content as yours. So they're just one cell away from albinism or a few cells away from albinism with this mutation SLC245, which is depletion of 111 amino acid. This happened in Central Asia. Before that, if you go back 24,000 years, 34,000 years, a lot of modern humans over there, the skeleton structures already changed, meaning that they didn't have pronatistic features compared to